Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. My special guest who I have on this evening, who's going to be again, Dan Platt of the Three Left Show podcast. Um, and we are going to be discussing Chapter 9 of The Conquest of Bread. We'll be doing a, the audiobook listen through and we're going to stop to, to comment. We're going to get started with that in just one moment. I'm going to give him a call here and we're going to get rolling. Hello. Happy Earth Day, by the way. Happy Earth Day to you as well. Yeah. Uh, um... I'm kind of feeling this, I, so so I don't have to talk about it later uh, and interrupt sure. the uh, readings, but like I've been despondent about the state, like the state of orgs, uh-huh. like there's really very little trust in organization, like we need them, mm-hmm. but everywhere I look, including my own organization, it's like there are people who are satisfied with the org they're in, it's because they're getting their way. When people don't get their way, it's like... This is corrupt. I don't like this. Fuck corporate. Uh, fuck this or fuck organizations. Like I just saw a post from the the guy in the Libertarian Socialist Caucus in the Libertarian Party, and he basically is quitting because um, like anything new I'd start would also get corrupted. Yeah. And in general, like it's not just anarchists. It's not just an anarchity kind of thing or an anarchist thing right it's generally a very like 30 and under kind of thing to not want to be an organization a collective a mutual aid project sure mm-hmm. that's what we're all gravitating towards or, or at least comfortable doing because easily there's no one in charge there doesn't have to be any i mean there can be there will be underliners and organizers but without it being an organization it means that there's no there no, doesn't have to be any conversation of rules or principles or standards mm. it's just kind of a do what feels good and if we don't meet each other's standards then we'll work it out it. piecemeal hmm. which organizations can do too but they do it formally and that's what everyone kind of distrusts because formal processes are like bureaucracies right and it's just they create inequalities or reinforce them don't they don't break them down and, and they, it's, they, it's a tough line because you can't really do anything big without a lot more. of people moving in the same direction yeah yeah at the same time i understand what you say about bureaucracy it does tend to to fall to the people that have been there the longest the people that have uh, put the most effort in, you know, it's kind of people that show up the most who end up just kind of dominating things, just kind of by default. And with good reason, they feel like they've really invested a lot and they want to make sure that their investment, it goes in the right direction. But at the same time, yeah, if you're not all moving in the same direction um, and you're just, just doing, you know, whatever you feel like in the moment, well, that's, that's not so much organizing as just kind of hanging out, talking, and then, and then kind of going off and doing your own thing. So maybe, maybe not the best strategy for something big, like, like even a, a local campaign, um, whatever. We're starting a co-op. Or starting a co-op or yeah, whatever. So yeah, I can definitely see both sides, but you got to have some sort of framework, I think at the end of the day, and it can be something you all build together and, and there can certainly be ways to onboard new people so they don't feel like they're e- either being asked too much of or, or um, completely out of their depth or just being dominated by people that have been there longer. There, there's, yeah. I'm sure there's a number of ways of doing it. It's, it's something of a full-time job to do that. Like, right. the, 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 it, there's something to large institutions having staff of people who do training. For sure. And they train everyone. Not, not a corporation that really shitty at like training new employees, but well, yeah. Um, like if the Greens, so I'm a member of the Green Party. I pay dues because like paying paying staff requires an income that's stable and isn't just fundraising bit to bit, like you know mutual aid projects do. Like it's 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 really easy mm-hmm. to like. It seems like a lot. Of, it's a lot of value being fundraised when you when you collect a lot of material to give out like during the pandemic. But really that's that's easy cuz you know we're all inundated with the abundance of our society. We always right. have a little extra. Right. It's money that scares uh, in our in you know our working class hands or capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's what's required to hire people. Yeah. And the org, but the orgs that do have hired people 
they retain that income through grants or fundraising by being part of the machinations of the Democratic Party or any other establishment, or they can't rock the boat. Um, but they are doing like positive work, but not building socialism, let's say. Yeah. Or anarchism. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. You know, I think it's just kind of a hard, kind of a, a capitalist realist truth that you have to grapple with that, that we are in a society that's dominated by capitalist enterprises. And because people don't have their basic needs met, that, that necessitates income from somewhere. Oh, I, people are trying to advertise on my damn channel. One second. But anyway, <laughs> it, it necessitates... Yeah. In the chat, yeah. I want to become famous? Yeah, I sure do, random guy in chat. Um, I'll deal with you later. Anyway, it, ne it necessitates capital, well, you know? Some soul dreams? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, getting anything going, having anything that, that, that requires, like you say, a full-time job, it, it requires capital coming in, you know, just because people need to get by. There's, there's no, I can, I'm comfortable in my life, so I can just volunteer all of my time. It's, it, it's not quite like that. People don't have that safety net. So it's just a, it's just a reality of, of the world that we live in under capitalism that, yeah, we kind of have to, to steer into it a little bit in order to create something sustainable and that's, that is going to attract enough people and keep them going long enough to actually make real change. So In the meantime, um, trying to join some kind of collective, it's... Uh, you know, it's like making friends when you can't go to the bars or something. Um, and, it's, and it's tough to make friends on the fly in protests. Right. <laughs> it just doesn't feel like the right time to chat people up. Um, at Food Not Bombs, that's the place where I actually make new connections. But as it's been, you know, safe contact, you know, it's not quite what it could be. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's because you're just coming, people come and go and pick up and drop off. Yeah. 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 Well, that's another, that's another aspect of it too. Those people that really get into a certain org and, and put, pour their whole heart and soul and their every, you know, every spare moment into it are the ones that end up burning out fastest. So it, it's them who need the care as well. But, you know, again, because of that, that not having anything to fall back on, that not having a safety net for everybody, they're forced to just keep going. And ah, it's, it's a vicious yeah. cycle. The work has to at least provide some stability. Yes. And it's kind of a catch-22 in that, like, you know, we want to organize to get, say, stable housing. Housing we don't have to pay for anymore. Mm hmm And for some, well, it's because we're all kind of trained to not be really good at working in an org. So either you spend your life um, trying to train people to work in an organization like the old hippies have mm -hmm. or you or like or the future like this is what i'm seeing like it's the future we figure out some way of organizing that doesn't use orgs and it's all just mutual aid networks yeah um but that but that work but that mm -hmm. work on a horizontalist scale and can scale up mm -hmm. or we do probably, and this is this is as the alternative that has already been done the last thirty years, trying to, to train enough people to work collectively enough in an organization like our veteran organizers who have been doing so mm -hmm. their whole lives. So it's, it's like they want to pass down their knowledge, but even they're really bad, or they don't have the mechanisms to pass it on to the throngs of millennials and Zoomers mm -hmm. because they are struggling just to keep the lights on in the office that, let's say it's a union org or, or even like an IWW chapter. Mm -hmm. Like they have trainings, but they need to be like every month with new people. And instead right. it's like annually with five people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, anyway, I uh, it was different because it was like a, this permanent encampment that got like a thousand people coming and going. Right. So yeah, they, they had that. that you know, these workshops every day for sure, and that's why it was such a burst that it like it needed that space. Like I just right. rewatched this uh, little 
Al Jazeera documentary was like the month after the big evictions, Occupy Wall Street attempted to take over a private lot from Trinity. Mm. But that's basically when it lost all the liberals. Because oh. only the left wingers and were left, like a few hundred dedicated activists, attempted to take this lot from Trinity. It's basically the same size as Ducati. And Trinity, this is Trinity Church, who owns a shit ton of real estate in Manhattan. Yeah, I think I've um, even heard of them, yeah. And they refuse to give the movement access to it. Mm. To make some arrangement, they just said, oh, it's complicated, we can't really give it over. Because, like, you know, we're going to mess it up, or we're going to disrupt any... Like, once we're there, it's like... It's private property. Just be, it's private yeah. property, fuck you. Yeah. Um, it's it's yeah. kind of what we heard. And and that's when it became like, and it was like, well, we're going to take over private property because that's getting in the way. That's like, this is where we're, this is what we're actually challenging. This is what this movement's supposed to be about. Mm-hmm. That's when we lost all the liberals and progressives. It was like, no, no, this is about electing Democrats. Oh, this is about yeah. private property or, or uh, our society as a whole. This is just for reform. Right. Or whatever. Or just showing our angst. And like, but no, it was, it was a core group that was, that was more push militant and ready. But, um, well, we couldn't, but the police were ready and they were ready to enforce private property rights way faster than, you know, the letting, letting us have a little rope, you know, take over a street for a week or two, you know, like Chaz or, sure. or any other occupation since really. Uh, which is why it hasn't really been a tactic that's been reused that much, like, unless it's done temporarily. Like we're only going to do this a week. But even even here in Albany, they didn't give us a full week. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. Just thinking about private property and and uh, losing the liberals. I think that's always going to be the case. They they just don't seem to understand that. The system itself is 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 curtailing people's rights. It's not going to just give it up without someone pushing past the current legal framework. I mean, they always harken back to like like MLK. Oh, he he did things peacefully. No, he didn't. He he shut down entire bridges. You know, he occupied um, lunch counters. That was against the law as well. Downtown areas got ransacked. Exactly. Yeah, the Even same sorts of riot. looting and, and rioting and all that sort of thing that they complain about today. That stuff happened then, and they should really know better because it's a lot of the people that lived through that era and and probably saw this on their TV live, that that are now complaining about the you know BLM doing doing the same sorts of things to gain rights, which is what every movement needs to do. And it, you're just going to bump up against the law at some point, you know. Same. The same rhetoric of outside agitation. Mm-hmm. Um, now, uh, a friend, God, my godfather actually, was being tongue in cheek, but um, it's, it, right wingers would also use it seriously. The whole these black BLM protesters, they're not from our city. Like, we're in a tri city area, by the way. And, like, yeah. no, they're from Saratoga. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> like, always the thing. There's a Saratoga BLM, and they, they mm-hmm. came and they're occupying outside you know and it is complete bullshit because we're tri-city area it's not like people in albany don't commute to troy schenectady saratoga uh, right. vice versa we are like our political structures should probably match our economic ones mm-hmm. but the economic ones are such in flux that mm-hmm. of course you can never really do it right uh, making our economics match our political structure like the city the town the village um the county that would be social revolution in itself. Right. For sure. For sure. Ah, well, I'm really enjoying this discussion, but I, I think we should probably get Let's in. move on. We should probably the- finally get to the, the, the uh, tonight's future presentation, if you will, the, the chapter nine of the Conquest of Bread. I think I got everything about as, as well hooked up as I'm going to tonight. Um, I'm wondering if it's just OBS that's that's blocking the correct routing. But I think, I think you're going to be coming through okay the way things are, at least people are able to hear you in the chat now. So um, I think we're ready to start. Um, before we do, though, if you want to just go ahead and, and plug your show, maybe give an update on, on what's happening on Three Lefts just before we, we get rolling here. Of course. Um, so I do the Three Lefts show. I have roughly a seventh of the number of uh, subscribers you have on Twitch. 
Um, but and I actually don't know my full listenership on all the platforms I'm on, but it's a podcast first and foremost that is on every podcast app, including Spotify, Stitcher, etc., uh, iTunes, um, but also streamed via a community radio station, which I do. That's so awesome. it's like I would not just podcast on my own. It's because that I'm doing it as a producer in a community of producers, including the local poetry group and and uh, church ladies and, and uh, this this woman who was on like the Democratic committee and she's going to start a show, Sassy Seniors, and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> That's um, awesome. And a lot, of, and of course, a lot of DJs in the evening. For sure. And uh, and that gets turned on in all the bodegas in town. That's so awesome. it is. I'm being to, I'm told that it's spreading out and it is. We do have listenership. So uh, the three lefts covers uh, so um, kind of like a cross between an ideology show. But it's basically leftist strategy and analysis of general events, big picture stuff, but also strategy of like how do we actually build socialism or how are other people doing things, trying to do kind of a general review. So I like covering a lot of different topics at once. Um, or not, not like one theme, but different points of view on it. Yeah. Then, so this month, alternating because I've been really helping my friend so i haven't really had time to especially on saturdays where i'm gonna do the show um i've been doing alternating between doing reruns and making clip shows out of all the youtube videos that inspired me over the years oh that's that's it very interesting yeah and these are all like videos i've had bookmarked for over a decade wow uh, or more you know some less but so like the next one will be more recent stuff from the last four years but the episode I just finished and posted, um, and you just shared, mm-hmm. is like the stuff that inspired me when I was in school in the late aughts, and then a bunch of ten-minute like mini lectures. One from Richard Wolff, oh. another from this other Marxist professor that no one's ever talked mentioned named Cohen, and it's just mm-hmm. like this was my introduction to any anti-capitalist thinking, like a Marxist who makes sense. Wow. Maybe I should think about this a little more. Uh huh. So maybe it'll inspire you. Um, and yeah, and that's really uh, great. a bit from David Harvey talking about the 09 crash and a Marxist interpretation of it. And like, yeah, this makes a lot more sense than all the progressive dribble I've been listening to the last three years, um, 2008 to uh-huh. 2010. Uh-huh. You know, uh, when, when, when the Democrats won, lost Congress, that's basically when like this whole progressive liberal paradigm has just come completely garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, even when they t- even when we like do whatever they ask to get help them take power, they don't use it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's quite sad. It, it it is very sad. So, that, yeah. Just just thinking about my own journey to the left, that that sounds very familiar. I think I would have uh, come to these ideas much much more sooner had I just found the right person and and listened to what they had to say. But like you know, all throughout high school, even throughout college, really, it, communism, anarchism, even socialism were just kind of things beyond what you'd really even consider as reasonable or rational. They're, they're just kind of silly, maybe utopian, maybe a, at worst, you know, just authoritarian in disguise. And so I just kind of didn't really pay them much mind. And then, you know, it's the same sort of thing. All it took was, it was hearing it from the right person, and it just it just kind of all clicked. And it was like, wow, there are actually solutions to all these problems that, that liberals like the Democrats have been supposedly struggling for for decade after decade and not making enough progress on. So, yeah, that's really cool. I, I'm, I look forward to, to looking at that myself. That, that's really awesome. There also has to be examples of it being real. Otherwise, it is kind of felt as that's being a realist. Too. Yeah, like, if sure. you're... Um, young, black, and in the hood. Like the, the thing that's most real to you is entrepreneurial hustle culture. Right. right. Like the ability to hustle and make make some money mm-hmm. and, and get make enough to maybe feel like you're safe or stable. Right. And that's what's the most real to them, and that's what they live by. Including like even when they're radical and BLM activists, they're still like yeah trying to do real estate, trading stocks. They're still like you know chasing right. money. Yeah. Um, and not thinking. They're not really, they're not lefties, quote unquote, you know, but of course they're definitely radical. They want structural change and they're ready to listen and, and argue about stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's not, it's not all like that. Um, sure. 
All right. Well, with that said, let's let's finally get into the chapter here. How about yeah. we'll start it up right now? Chapter that answers that ContraPoints challenge. That uh, oh. you know, the challenge of socialism. That she likes stuff. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're we're talking about the need for luxury, something you don't hear too often from the left. So here we go. In collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. Read by Harriet Rogers and produced by Lindsay Thorson. Chapter 9. The Need for Luxury. Part 1. Man, however, is not a being whose exclusive purpose in life is eating, drinking, and providing a shelter for himself. As soon as his material wants are satisfied, other needs of an artistic character will thrust themselves forward the more ardently. Aims of life vary with each and every individual, and the more society is civilized, the more will individuality be developed, and the more will desires be varied. Even today, we see men and women denying themselves necessaries to acquire mere trifles, to obtain some particular gratification or some intellectual or material enjoyment. A Christian or an ascetic may disapprove of these desires for luxury, but it is precisely these trifles that break the monotony of existence and make it agreeable. Would life, with all its inevitable sorrows, be worth living if, besides daily work, man could never obtain a single pleasure according to his individual tastes? If we wish for a social revolution, it is no doubt in the first place to give bread to all. To transform this execrable society in which we can every day see robust workmen dangling their arms for want of an employer who will exploit them, women and children wandering shelterless at night, whole families reduced to dry bread, men, women, and children dying for want of care and even for want of food. It is to put an end to these iniquities that we rebel. But we expect more from the revolution. We see that the worker, compelled to struggle painfully for bare existence, is reduced to ignorance of these higher delights. The highest within man's reach, of science and especially of scientific discovery, of art and especially of artistic creation. It is in order to obtain these joys for all, which are now reserved to a few, in order to give leisure and the possibility of developing intellectual capacities, that the social revolution must guarantee daily bread to all. After bread has been secured, leisure is the supreme aim. No doubt. Oh, cut. Yep, I was was just right on that at the same point, too. Uh, Why don't you go ahead first? Okay. So I'm just going to take issue, at least from an anarchist point of view, Mm -hmm. on the word leisure. This is Uh, much later. But in the say seventies, eighties, whatever, there's there's these critiques of work, and like Bill Black and there's other writers. I, I've got a, a different. There's abolishment of work, but then there's another book like abolish work. Anyway, mm-hmm. but it points out that like leisure is like part of the work culture that you need to take mm. a vacation from work to revive yourself just uh-huh. enough to work more. Right, like. Like, people get tired of being on vacation. It's actually quite boring. Mm-hmm. But it's like, the, like oh, we go on vacation to get away from it all, to not work. But then, when people, when I watch people on vacation, um, they look like they're working. Like, they look like they're stressed out. Like, they, it takes a lot of work to go on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> or to be relaxed or whatever. Yeah, uh-huh. it's just, um, I, I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm overthinking it no. that way. But... I th- I when think I go on vacation, I'm literally like not planning a bit of it, except maybe a general like st- uh, sketch of action. But I'm also when I do these things, I'm alone. But even when I'm with <laughs> someone, I hope they're of the same mindset of hey, hey, let's just do that. Hey, let's just do that. You know, not worry about much. Um, just make sure we're just prepared enough. Um, yeah. But it's not like we're not there to get away from work. As much right. as we're there to just enjoy life, exactly. So yeah. there's, there's a difference in attitude and in usually the execution of leisure versus, I don't know, enjoying life. I, th- I think that is an important reframing of things. Yeah, leisure shouldn't be determined, uh, shouldn't be defined. That is in terms of work. It, it should be something of itself that you can use as you like, or not use at all, as as some would see it. But you know, just do whatever comes to you. And, you know, I. You know, you talked about going on vacation. I, I I love that same sort of mindset on vacation too. I don't like the stress of having to have 
a complete planned out itinerary for everything. We've got to hit up this, this, that, and the other thing. You know, you just kind of go with it. And, and fun things always come up. Interesting things always catch your eye. And, and that's, that's what I like most about vacation as well. Um, so, yeah, I think that is an important way to reframe it. Not in terms of, of work, as, as though you're just a robot who needs to recharge their batteries before you go back and get plugged into the factory, but as something that is just another component of life. Um, so I, th- I, th- I think that's an important reframing. And I think it's important to uh, what they're what they're also saying about leisure is that keep in mind that, yes, we want to provide this basic platform for everyone's necessities. We want them to, to have all of their basic needs taken care of so that they can push off of that platform and, and pursue whatever they think it is. And that could be as, as simple as lying in a hammock for the rest of your time. Or it could be art, or it could be, you know, doing what I'm doing right now, doing a, doing a, a live show of some kind. But yeah, it, it can't just be... We're critiquing a modern conception of leisure, and right. not the one kind that Kropotkin's using. Okay, yeah, that's a good point as well. All right, well, let's just keep on here. When hundreds and thousands of human beings are in need of bread, coal, clothing, and shelter, luxury is a crime. To satisfy it, the worker's child must go without bread. But in a society in which all can eat sufficiently, the needs which we consider luxuries today will be the more keenly felt. And as all men do not and cannot resemble one another, the variety of tastes and needs is the chief guarantee of human progress, there will always be, and it is desirable that there should always be, men and women whose desire will go beyond those of ordinary individuals in some particular direction. Everybody does not need a telescope because, even if learning were general, there are people who prefer examining things through a microscope to studying the starry heavens. Some like statues, some pictures. A particular individual has no other ambition than to possess an excellent piano, while another is pleased with an accordion. The tastes vary, but the artistic needs exist in all. In our present poor capitalistic society, the man who has artistic needs cannot satisfy them unless he is an heir to a large fortune or by dint of hard work, appropriates to himself an intellectual capital which will enable him to take up a liberal profession. Still, he cherishes the hope of someday satisfying his tastes more or less, and for this reason he reproaches the idealist communist societies with having the material life of each individual as their sole aim. Quote, in your communal stories you may perhaps have bread for all, he says to us, but you will not have beautiful pictures, optical instruments, luxurious furniture, artistic jewelry. In short, the many things that minister to the infinite variety of human tastes. And in this way, you suppress the possibility of obtaining anything besides the bread and meat which the commune can offer to all, and the gray linen in which all your lady citizens will be dressed. These are the objections which all communist systems have to consider, and which the founders of new societies established in American deserts never understood. And I think that's a a sort of a stereotype. Chapter 10. Whoops. Real works. Part one. Oh my goodness. I went back. Oh, you know what? Sorry I just hit me what he means by founders of new societies in American deserts. He's referring to like the Owens. The Owens. I'm not familiar with that group. Oh, uh, well, uh, um, Owenists or whatever. Well, okay. There, there were these uh, richer socialists who had the capital and they would found utopian projects like okay. Harmony, Indiana, and whatever. And they're, they're in the Midwest. Sure. And uh, they didn't work out too well. Like they, they last a year or so. Uh, they're usually pointed to by Fox. The con. Oh shoot! Whatever. Um, but yeah, they didn't. Uh, they, they, they were, they were kind of okay as communes, much like hippie communes. But mm-hmm. like they didn't uh, give leisure or luxury allowances because that would require more capital than they were able to. Like more than you could produce. I see. Uh, they, like they were, they were based on being self-sufficient as possible, but, but because they were funded by rich guys, it's like they were never really self-sufficient. It was just a uh, subsidy. Just the illusion. Of um, it, yeah. 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 Um, mm. But yeah, some some of what he's talking about is kind of from his era, because with cheaper kind of ways of doing art. Right. That uh, and materials and, and computers and computing, um, even it's definitely more accessible. You don't have to be in a liberal profession, as it were, to be able to make art. All you need is spray paint, and you can start tagging um, and point. making urban art. 
though uh, this also reminds me of how when it comes to making art, the means do need to be seized, like in Big New York Blackout. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of young youths, they stole the record players and the expensive um, equipment they needed or, or wanted, and they started making hip-hop. A very and good hip hop point. was created um, because there was a blackout in New because York and it allowed for a lot of looting to occur. Yeah. And it wasn't, it's not like property was taken over, and, uh, but it was music, you know, music equipment and stuff. Oh, that's very You know, the pianos, the pianos and the mm -hmm. accordions. Wow. Um, the pianos and the accordions, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, one thing that, that this, this, passage here brings up for me is they were talking about how you know everyone is afforded their gray blankets and their meager living quarters and all this sort of thing it seems like the same sort of stereotypes about the way that that uh non-capitalist countries function uh, basically from the time of the soviet union where everything is just uniform and gray and dull and there's no joy in everyone's life and and all that sort of thing and uh he's talking about how that doesn't have to be so you know that we can still have all these these other things that make life worth living, and I, I would tend to the agree bus, with them. The bus stops were very diverse in the Soviet Union. Were they? I didn't, uh, I didn't actually know that. Oh yeah, yeah. There's um, in fact, there's a lot of art and architecture in the Soviet Union that's really diverse mm -hmm. and everywhere. But but a lot of it has been maintained. It's been forgotten because capital yeah. doesn't give a shit. You know, yeah. Like Russia was a uh, you know turned over into back into an oligarchy. And yeah, there are the stereotypes of the visuals of, of um, Maoist China and the Soviet Union with uniformity in production right. for the basics. Right. Right. And luxuries, like they weren't quite there in mass producing luxuries. Mm -hmm. This required a lot more, probably external trade, uh, if there wasn't the huge, you know, Cold War of embargoing and we're not going to trade with you kind of stuff. Uh, although they kind of did in some ways. But it kind of reminds me of how uh, in Yugoslavia, where you had something more market socialism, they did have a wide variety of consumer products. All of the industries were worker controlled. Mm -hmm. What the their system didn't really have, though, was a mechanism for new investment. Mm. The ability to have a state bank and reinvest things and decide where new the creation of new industries mm -hmm. so they're kind of stuck with the industries that were created in the 50s and 60s and they needed outside investment world bank loans and oh. you know when the, when the cold war ended and that's what created the country to break up yeah because uh the stress from the world bank the um neoliberal agenda was too much to keep a, uh, the country can stay together hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, I, I haven't really dug There's into There's some good videos on this. I, uh, that I'm sounds some of them. No, that, that sounds very interesting. I haven't really looked into Yugoslavia in, in particular, but that, that's that's very interesting to to kind of take a, a high view of, of or like a 50,000 foot view or whatever you call it. Uh, There's a particular meme of like um, pointing out that they had like 30 different chocolate brands. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's like, oh, in, in a socialist country, there's no diversity in, uh, you know, in goods. And like, well, Yugoslavia had very different chocolate brands. Yeah. Well, and, and the counter to that is always yeah. there's, there's more than there are now here. Yeah. But also the, the, the counter meme to that is always like the showing the variations of Dr. Pepper and how there's, you know, 42 different varieties, which are all just the same thing. You get the same exact product, product packaged with a different label. Uh, so... And then, and then, and again with the housing as well, you take any aerial view of, of basically any suburb that's been built since the 70s in the United States, and it's pretty dang uniform, you know? You're not Some getting a lot of them of have, have turrets. Have, have what now? Turrets. 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 Yeah, yeah, once in a while you, some, you see a some turret. Some of them have two garages. <laughs> that's right. Some of them have a lawyer for you. I'm, jo I'm taking jokes from the no. expansion now. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally got that. Yeah, and uh, I, I deliver to the suburbs all the time. That's my day job is, is delivery driver. So I, I see all that day in and day out. Oh, yeah. And it's pretty easy to kind of just let everything blur together and you, you wouldn't know which suburb you're, you're in at any given time. And it seems the trend now is to, to have not even just a two-car garage, but you have that extra third stall 
in, in the, the newer construction so you can fit even more of your junk that you end up having your kids throw away once once you finally pass. So yeah, there's well, they're 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 all using um, storage units. So well, that that too, yeah. We're getting really off track, but but I mean, <laughs> I'm just, okay. just to tie back in the whole like you know we have we live in our age in Dr. Popkins. Right. We live in an age where we all kind of have well not all but you know middle class lower middle class and above you know especially since because of Walmart we can have all of these you know extra abundance of, of goods mm-hmm. that become garbage um, though we. In Albany, we have like two buy nothing groups, which is for middle class people to basically uh, pass on their garbage to other people. Yeah, that's um, cool to see those bringing up. Because they, they're too stingy, I guess, to just give it to the free store, um, which doesn't have a permanent location. If it did, it would probably solve that. Um, um, right now, okay. we just have a really, really free market. Have you heard of those? I, I, I am familiar with the concept, yeah. Yeah, we have a really, really free market, but we haven't quite expanded to the point where all the people in the buy nothing groups are just kind of because they're too lazy to drop their shit off at one location. They want people. I mean, there, there's, there's two groups because one were really entitled. Like they wanted like, oh, you have to pick it up and I'm not going to like wait for you. I'm just going to put it on my porch or in the street. But then it would shit. get taken by someone else. So it's sure. like, what the fuck? Yeah. And got all that a lot effort. of all bullshit, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> a lot of class of shit. And so you have this other group that's a little better, or at least middle class. But like you know, a little less assy, uh, <laughs> stick up their ass. But um, but it's still really inefficient because you have like you know, right. dog, like uh, my friend has piles and stuff, stuff, and he has to like basically Uber drive around the city, dropping off little trinkets. Oh really? Wow. Just so that's, it's not getting thrown out. That's but dedication, it's, it's, though. Good, good on them. Yeah, but he's not gonna. I don't think he's gonna do it for you know. He's he's not been doing it for a while. Oh uh, okay. I was questioning why he was doing it. It's just, I see. Put it, put it, put them all in the tub. Give it to the free market. Yeah, um, there you go. I'll take it there. Blah blah blah. Sounds easy enough. Yeah, I really wish they had one of those in in every city. I I would bet there'd be one in the the Twin Cities metro here, but I, I'm just not aware of of anything that operates quite. They're like easy that. to put together. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. A, here are the steps. Rent a storage room from u-haul or something for like you know 30 bucks okay for 50, 40 40 50 bucks a yeah, month. yeah. Uh, but you only need it for a month i guess uh take donations for a month have people like drop stuff off there or you you in a car since you're driving around pick stuff up for people one car load at a time fill up that storage unit um and then on the on the sale on the day you just uh, via car loads and volunteers move all that stuff to your local park or whatever passes for one um, and just have a big free yard sale. That's awesome. That sounds really cool. I'll have to, I'll have to file that idea away from, you know, maybe times when people are more willing to get together. You know, and if not for a storage, um, if someone has a free garage. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. I like that a lot. That's really cool. Okay. Let's get back on to the, the book though. Our, I'm going to have to, I bumped a button, so I'm going to have to find our, our place. Just one second here. I forgot Wait, that what? the feeling of art existed in the agriculturalist as well as in the burger. And notwithstanding oh, okay. that the expression of artistic. I think that's relatively close. I think we were probably. It's a bit past that. Um, yeah, let's just back up just a little bit then. I read a little, little bit of this. I think that's where. It's a page. It's a page ahead. We need sufficiently. The needs which we consider luxuries today will be the more keenly felt. Okay, I think we've gone through this. Already. And as all men do not and cannot resemble one another, the variety of tastes and needs is the chief guarantee of human progress. There will always be, and it is desirable that there should always be, men and women whose desire will go beyond those of ordinary individuals in some particular direction. Everybody does not need a telescope because, even if learning were general, there are people who prefer examining things through a microscope to studying the starry heavens. Some like statues, some pictures. A particular individual has no other ambition than to possess an excellent piano, while another is pleased with an accordion. The tastes vary, but the artistic needs exist in all. In our present poor capitalistic society, the man who has artistic needs cannot satisfy them unless he is an heir to a large fortune or by dint of hard work, appropriates to himself an intellectual capital which will enable him to take up a liberal profession. 
Still, he cherishes the hope (laughs) of someday satisfying his tastes more or less. And for this reason, he reproaches the idealist communist societies with having the material life of each individual as their sole aim. Quote, in your communal stores, you may perhaps have bread for all, he says to us. But you will not have beautiful pictures, optical instruments, luxurious furniture, artistic jewelry. In short, the many things that minister to the infinite variety of human tastes. And in this way, you suppress the possibility of obtaining anything besides the bread and meat which the commune can offer to all, and the gray linen in which all your lady citizens will be dressed. End quote. These are the objections which all communist systems have to consider, and which the founders of new societies established in American deserts never understood. They believe that if the community could procure sufficient cloth to dress all its members, a music hall in which the brothers could strum a piece of music or act a play from time to time, it was enough. They forgot that the feeling of art existed in the agriculturalist as well as in the burgher, and, notwithstanding that the expression of artistic feeling varies according to the difference in culture, in the main it remains the same. In vain did the community guarantee the common necessities of life. In vain did it suppress all education that would tend to develop individuality. In vain did it eliminate all reading save the Bible. Individual tastes broke forth and caused general discontent. Quarrels arose when somebody proposed to buy a piano or scientific instruments, and the elements of progress flagged. The society could only exist on condition that it crushed all individual feeling, all artistic tendency, and all development. The straw men were Will the born. anarchist commune be impelled by the same direction? <laughs> Evidently not, if it understands that while it produces all that is necessary to Thanks, material Richard life, Owen. it must also strive to satisfy... Sorry, what? Thanks, Richard Owen. <laughs> yeah. It really, I mean, there are some early socialists where it's like, well, they thanks fucking lot, you know. It's like they, yeah. they're leftists to say Trotsky is the bad guy or Stalin. Even no, 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 no. It was these early socialists. They they created all these straw men that just kind of mm. fed into all the other. That's a shame. That's a shame. Bad, bad, you know. That's I mean, sh- they they didn't know what they're doing. Um, well, we, that's how uh, new systems were, there were people develop. of their time, you know, where reading the Bible was like, I mean, it was the best book I ever written. So why would you need, <laughs> why any would you need anything else? Yeah. A library? Ugh. We yeah. don't have money for that. Uh, that's not in the budget. Yeah. Well, I mean, and what people don't seem to grasp is that it's not as though capitalism emerged from feudalism fully formed with the, you know, the New York stock exchange and, and, uh, you know, 10,000, worker uh, corporations and all these things it was it was not even all at once it came in fits and starts that's the way a new system breaks out and 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 eventually overcomes it's never in one fell swoop it's it's always messy and you're always going to have a bunch of bad examples to look back on and say well you know if you want to try this new thing look at what this person did uh he totally screwed it so don't even try because you're going to end up going down the same route but that's, you know, that only, that sort of talk only ever goes away finally when there's success in, in the newer system that that's, that here's, appears to be lasting. Here's a contradiction from like Marxist philosophy on like, um, you know, capitalism creates the tools from which, you know, we can move on to socialism. Uh, it, like Kropotkin for this chapter kind of needs to make the case that an anarchist communist society can produce enough that everyone can actually have luxuries, mm-hmm. in which even in the 20th century, socialist societies or you know, countries could not actually deliver that. They uh, came they a long damn did, way, though, from where they were at. Exactly. They did their best. Yeah. Okay. But they still fell short of For you sure. know, Pepsi or whatever, you know, whatever America has. Uh, or live. I mean, it's all. I mean, you can see that all is propaganda. But like, let's like, let's just talk. Um, we're not even talking about the 20th century. We're talking about today. Mm-hmm. All right. The, the the variety, the subcultures. Although you could say at the same time, everything's all the same too. But I don't know. With my like, we're all making all this different art and culture here. The internet age. Right. And this has all been possible through a mix of institutions, like say the Pentagon. Yeah, creating the internet. Very but much so. this is all a result of industrial capitalism. Mm-hmm. So and destroying the planet. So yeah. it's like, yeah, <laughs> can we do? Can we even like in our thought experiments deliver on luxuries for all, mm-hmm. um, gay luxury space communism, while still being sustainable and equitable? 
I, I mean, I, I would just have to say that we can't maintain this level of um, consumer production at the very least by any means. At, at some point, it has to come to an end, whether that's because of limitations through climate change or whether it's material conditions uh, such as just lack of, of um, source materials of, of one kind or another. But you know, yeah, it doesn't matter if we continue with this system or we, we try something new. We, we can't maintain this level of consumption and we can't, you know, nor can we expect the entire world to catch up to the, the consumption levels of the United States. It's just, it's just not possible. There's not that many planets that we have to, to draw resources from. But here's where we can add in ecology and doesn't have to be, um, you know, for sure. A primitive here. No, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about stuff. going back to, you know, stone know, tools know, and stuff like, like that. This, the, the, what you just said is usually what newbies or potential leftists hear. Right. And they're like, well, I like stuff. I don't want yeah. less stuff. But it's like, well, what if that stuff was durable or compostable so that you can is like the problem is that all the stuff we make is disposable right. and not reusable. Right. If it was, then we could make actually luxuries for all and do it sustainably. So yeah. I answer my question. Yeah. There's, there's a lot like, of loops. Like, you close like that, but yeah. Does. <laughs> I pose a question just so I can answer it after, you know, all right. Oh, and I just want to say hello to, uh, I'm, I'm going to guess your name is Zach App in the chat. You've said hello. So, hello. How are you doing tonight? Welcome to uh, Bread Theory. Um, if you're new, to, I, I'm assuming you're new to the channel. So just to, to give you a little idea, we cover uh, leftist audiobooks and, and we're going through the conquest of bread right now. We're in chapter nine. So if you have anything to add to the discussion, you want to ask any questions, feel free to. Otherwise, uh, welcome to the stream. Thanks for, thanks for being here. All right. Uh, let's continue on with the chapter. Oh boy, we got a big uh, comment here before we go on. One thing I like to bring up is that our food security is based a lot on petroleum distilled input, uh, creating a false sense of abundance in comparison to the natural world. I love soil. Uh, I would love soil to be the driving factor for making food prices go down and the reasons for transport and then capitalism can't act like we rely on it. Uh, thoughts? Too true. I, I think that, that's, that's absolutely true. true. Right. We, we have this abundance of, of stored sunlight in the form of petroleum products that we are burning through. Uh, the last time I checked, which was admittedly a few years ago, we were going through, they estimated about 35,000 years of stored petroleum. Like it took the breakdown of, of most of the animals like algae, or not animals, but beings like algae. Uh, to, to uh, about 35,000 years to produce all the oil that, and, and other petroleum products that we burn through in a year. I'm guessing that number has either gone up or is at least holding steady. So just through simple mathematics, we're, we're definitely not creating 35,000 years of petroleum through the breakdown of, of animals around the planet. So at some point, it, it does have to catch up with us. So this is an abundance for now. And, and I think there are definitely smart ways of using that abundance to make some more permanent things like uh, especially when you look into things like permaculture um, if you use that abundance to change the texture of the land so that you can uh, harvest rainwater better and and kind of you know even out the the extremes that, that climate change is bringing on us so so where you're capturing water and you're storing it in the soil and having it slowly move through the soil rather than rushing off in in the the, the high uh, rainfall events or completely drying out in the, the more arid events. If you just, if you're using it like, a, like say a backhoe, let's say using that fossil fuel to actually make something that can kind of mitigate those, those sorts of shocks to the system. I think that is, is moving petroleum products in a good direction and using it for, for future uh, sustainability. I, I prefer resilience. I think that's what we need more than anything is is resilience because just wait, just wait till corporations co opt that word too. I know. I mean, it's it's just an endless moving from from word to word. But for now, I, I think resilience uh, at least the only word they can't co op is anarchism and socialism. I know that's because why you... because they've screwed it over themselves too much over the years. So <laughs> they poison the well. They um, definitely have. Just remember, folks, it takes about five to ten years to really kind of get a permaculture farm going. So to meet right. that 2030 deadline, if we can give ourselves deadlines again, though, uh, 
when I joined Occupy, I kind of thought 2020 was kind of like a deadline for something. But really, I is there's really no such thing as a deadline. But let's say it's a you know a goal that we start now and we all kind of have access to a permaculture garden or farm by the end of the decade, so that we'll at least be able to eat a little bit um, mm-hmm. when when the the dollar stops being the global reserve currency. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, thank you very much for your, your addition there. Zach App, I'm, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that right. I'm assuming that's how you Zach, right. Zach Attack. Yeah, another fellow Zach. That's that's That happens to be my name as well. You probably didn't know that, but uh, I am a, a fellow Zach. So uh, you, you're saying that you thought 2012 was going to be the deadline. Yeah, yeah. There was definitely, so 2020. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that, that was just the, the chatter Zach App was saying. He thought, uh, I'm assuming he thought that uh, 2012 was the deadline for um, global catastrophe. Yeah, I mean, they're always refining it. Like, I used to be in, into the whole uh, peak oil sort of, I guess I wouldn't really call it a conspiracy, but I guess the, the theory of peak oil. Oh, I, you're being sarcastic. I got it, Zach App. Um, yeah, I used, I used to be into that uh, more, and they... they, they Basically, all of their projections had us peaking before 2020. I think like 2018 tended to be the, the latest peak information. But that I mean, it just well, goes to show. Peak oil, but not fossil fuels. They right, and that and that's the, and that's the part they didn't calculate. That's the part that they couldn't have imagined. So yes, they're they're saying the deadline now is 2030. You never know how things are going to go. There could be global catastrophe that that brings that deadline even closer. You know, you never know how things are going to go. What peak oil missed on the whole, because I've been thinking about this, because some of the videos in my new clip show podcast, the first hour, in fact, both talks mention peak oil mm-hmm. as part of the narrative, because they're both in the aughts. You know, two things they have in common is busting on the Iraq war and peak oil. Um, totally not mutually exclusive. But the point is that they didn't really weren't using Marxism or they couldn't be open about using Marxism to talk about, like, this system has to run out of gas and it will be forced to change. But what a lot of peak oil or environmentalists only, without any Marxism or class analysis, don't know is that capitalism will adjust. Mm-hmm. It will adjust to exploit some other area. Things will not get better corporate control-wise or lack of democracy-wise just because we get off of fossil fuels or we have to. No, there's no have to. Capitalism will find a way of fucking things up more, or very least, continuing the machine. Oh, yeah. They'll do whatever they can to goose it. Completely breaks in the same way that the slave economy of the Romans or the fuel economy of the Bourbons just broke down. Yeah. And couldn't do anything anymore. They are driving this uh, steam engine right off the cliff. And, you know, as long as they're dead before they hit the bottom, I guess I guess they don't really mind either way. Yeah. So so a lot of Green New Deal stuff like it. it, it, it so many people believe I mean, it's in reform. good stuff, but it's okay. It's, let's move on. Sorry. Yeah, it's not going to bring us all the way there. We'll just, we'll just leave it at that. It's 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 more or less fiddling around the margins when we need real drastic change. But but yeah, anyway, let's let's continue on with the book. Um, so getting back into the chapter. Yeah. By all manifestations of the human mind. Part two. We frankly confess that when we think of the abyss of poverty and suffering that surrounds us, when we hear the heart-rending cry of the worker walking the streets begging for work, we are loath to discuss the question. How will men act in a society whose members are properly fed to satisfy Thanks certain individuals desirous really of possessing it. a piece of sev china or a velvet dress? We are tempted to answer, let us make sure of bread to begin with, we shall see to China and velvet later on. But as we recognize that man has other needs besides food, and as the strength of anarchy lies precisely in that it understands all human faculties and all passions and ignores none, we shall, in a few words, explain how man can contrive to satisfy all his intellectual and artistic needs. We have already mentioned that by working four or five hours a day till the age of 45 or 50, man could easily produce all that is necessary to guarantee comfort to society. But the day's work of a man accustomed to toil does not consist of hours. It is a 10 hours day for 300 days a year and lasts all his life. Of course, when a man is harnessed to a machine, his health is soon undermined and his intelligence is blunted. 
But when man has the possibility of varying occupations, and especially of alternating manual with intellectual work, he can remain occupied without fatigue, and even with pleasure, for ten or twelve hours a day. Consequently, the man who will have done four or five hours of manual work necessary for his existence will have before him five or six hours which he will seek to employ according to his tastes. And these five or six hours a day will fully enable him to procure for himself, if he associates with others, all he wishes for, in addition to the necessaries guaranteed to all. He will discharge first his task in the field. Go for it. Oh, well, I guess let, let them continue on, I guess. Um, finish the explanation. Sure. Go on, which he owes to society as his contribution to the general production. And he will employ the second half of his day, his week, or his year to satisfy his artistic or scientific needs, or his hobbies. Okay. But how, but with what stuff? Like, is that going to be, like, in, will there be a paint factory that makes the paints that he's going to use? Yeah. He's painting. Like, this is like, he kind of actually said, oh, we'll worry about it later, let's focus on bread first. I mean, he's kind of like, this is how the state capitalist societies have kind of handled this. Yeah, let's focus on all the essentials and, and ending poverty first, then we'll make better the dist- you know distribution of funds for making movies and art and, uh, and, and just having a stocked art store. Uh-huh. I mean, did... I guess this is something to research. Yeah. Does the Soviet Union have art supply stores where you go and you spend some of your rubles on sure. arts? You could, you know, you could do that. I'm sure they're probably a war. Um, but anyway, that's that's yeah. totally different than what he's talking about where you have a 20-hour work week. Interesting right. note on my own lifestyle because of my the advantages of my existence – privileges that um i worked really hard the last two weeks guess how hard how far long i worked i actually worked a 40 hour week i have not done so in five years oh okay um otherwise i've been working a 20 hour week uh-huh. so i've kind of been living the anarchist dream yeah <laughs> and that's kind of why i have a lot of hobbies and i do the, the political activism i i have the time and mm-hmm. and i'm always busy i'm never bored yeah, that's that's awesome, and and you know I'd I'd be very curious to see um, if anyone's done a more updated calculation of just looking at basic necessities, how many uh, hours per person uh, today people would need to work in order to satisfy all those basic needs. Um, I'm guessing it's a lot less than forty. It's it's kind of bizarre that forty somehow fits into every single kind of job. All of it needs forty hours of your time. And, and yet there's such a diversity of jobs and such a diversity of workloads that, you know, kind of kind of doesn't even out there somewhere. So I'm guessing there's a that's lot. How you get a, that's how you get office workers spending half their time playing um, Minecraft Absolutely. Uh, in the office. Or on dating profiles. And, or, yeah. <laughs> well, otherwise, it's the, well, I wish I could just do dating profiles. Work. <laughs> but um, the, what the hell am I thinking about? That, oh yeah, the 40 hours is like, because 40, like we have a standard 40 hour work week. That's why like it's important, like say in France or in Spain, that they lower it to 35 or 30 hours. Mm -hmm. And like, that that needs to be something legislated like the minimum wage. Yeah. That as long as you don't regulate it, 40, the whatever, like it's it's, it's an eight hour work day. Yeah. And doing that five hours, that's 40 hours. That's why it's 40 hours. Uh-huh. We legislated the eight hour work day. And that was something that had to be legislated and fought for. So generally, um, it has nothing to do with how much work that actually needs to be done. Right. It's actually, this is the standard. So when someone is hired to do a job, it's 40 hours a week. And if there isn't right. like enough work to do the 40 hours, then it's part time. And then you don't get the benefits or whatever. Um, and that's usually what I've done. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, that's why like I think if Scotland is considering, I don't know if it's Scotland in particular, maybe just a Scottish city, uh, considering a lowering the the work week, you know. But this this is a way we can actually create jobs mm-hmm. is lower the work week so that uh, without losing pay, 
Right. Or we all do take a pay cut, but then, hey, if we all have less income, um, and that includes rich people even, mm-hmm. then prices might actually go down. Yeah. yeah. It always goes up because you can always produce more during the same 40-hour week. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's true as well. Like, Just think of how much automation, mechanization, and, and just efficiencies of things like ply, uh, supply lines have vastly increased the amount of, of um, labor that is, is able to be done since Kropotkin's time. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we could get that number pretty far down and, and still enjoy uh, a nice quality of life, um, as, as well as, of course, me- meeting all of our basic necessities. So yeah, interesting things to, to think about there. Let's continue on. Yeah, the next few paragraphs are another kind of uh, mm-hmm. thing that leftists get slapped with. Okay, let's let's listen in. These will spring up to gratify every taste and every possible fancy. Some, for example, will give their hours of leisure to literature. They will then form groups comprising authors, compositors, printers, engravers, draftsmen, all pursuing a common aim: the propagation of ideas that are dear to them. Nowadays, an author knows that there is a beast of burden, the worker, to whom, for the sum of a few shillings a day, he can entrust the printing of his books. But he hardly cares to know what a printing office is like. If the compositor suffers from lead poisoning, and if the child who sees to the machine dies of anemia, are there not other poor wretches to replace them? But when there will be no more starvelings ready to sell their work for a pittance, when the exploited worker of today will be educated and will have his own ideas to put down in black and white and to communicate to others, then the authors and scientific men will be compelled to combine among themselves and with their printers in order to bring out their prose and their poetry. So long as men consider fustian and manual labor as a mark of inferiority, it will appear amazing to them to see an author setting up his own book in type. For has he not a gymnasium or games by way of diversion? But when the opprobrium connected with manual labor has disappeared, when all will have to work with their hands, there being no one to do it for them, then the authors as well as their admirers will soon learn the art of handling composing sticks and type. They will Oops. Keep going. The other, all admirers okay. of the work to be printed. To set up the type, to shape it into pages, to take it in its virginal purity from the press. These beautiful machines, instruments of torture to the child who attends on them from morn till night, will be a source of enjoyment for those who will make use of them in order to give voice to the thoughts of their favorite author. Will literature lose by it? Will the poet be less a poet after having worked out of doors or helped with his hands to multiply his work? Will the novelist lose his knowledge of human nature after having rubbed shoulders with other men in the forest or the factory, in the laying out of a road or on a railway line? Can there be two answers to these questions? Maybe some books will be less voluminous, but then more will be said on fewer pages. Maybe fewer waste sheets will be published, but the matter printed will be more attentively read and more appreciated. The book will appeal to a larger circle of better educated readers who will be more competent to judge. I mean, that's a nice idea that all of a sudden after revolution, the the working man and, and the work that he does will lose all its stigma and people will be more inclined to try out doing these different labors if you see like you give the example of the author of course it's very different nowadays with home printers and stuff like that but the idea that they would just be able ink? to oh go yeah. ahead go ahead and cut in no no, no you finish I ink printers saying... get a lot of shit uh-huh. but you know paper jams and whatnot yeah but they are quite a miracle they are it's it's past. incredibly amazing um not only home printing but just like even in the 70s with future shock it was like more books so many more books were being published mm-hmm. that the universal number system had to be created mm. so that there actually could be an accounting of how many books were being published. I never made that connection um, before. That's cool. I, I only know of it because I'm, I've been working with a bookseller, and I now know that the number system was created in 72. Mm-hmm. Before then, there was a number system for the Library of Congress. Mm-hmm. So any book that was like published and put in the Library of Congress got a number, but it's now completely useless because I, I suppose not enough books got them. But only after 72 did every book mostly get a number. Interesting. And now you can just type in that number that on Amazon and see if uh-huh. it's there. <laughs> yeah. um, or we look up what the book is uh, worth, you know, that's, right. that's what we're using it for. But um, yeah, he doesn't kind of mention all the time. Uh, 
listening to this, I'm only thinking of like, it's not the only thing I'm thinking of, but like he doesn't kind of go into like, where's the resources from the commons mm-hmm. come from for these? He just kind of says that these bands of literature Stupid. will come together yeah. and start doing printing. Right. Like, well, they're going to need capital, don't they? They, yeah. they need a stream of resources, don't right. they? Do they? Does it come from the commons? How is this out? Yeah, I mean, how I uh, is it words? I was just gonna say how how I understand it. How I, I you know I'm kind of reading into things, but how I understand it is that you know in his estimation the factories are going to be taken over by the workers that are already working at them. Your production lines, you know, assuming you're not completely cut off and isolated from the rest of the world, will still be continuing on, and it's just going to be a different form of economy where people will just you know yeah. You know, we, we have a bunch of, of, of logs. Here you go. Here's here's some logs for your paper mill. Oh, you know, here's some books that we made from our logs. Here you go. We'll take that back to uh, the countryside to, to, you know, for education and your pleasure. Oh, yeah. Your... One of the factories will be a printing. Mm-hmm. And, one, and one will be a printing press. Yeah. So I, I, I tend to. That, that's kind of how I read into it is that just through this 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 mutual yeah. aid system of mutual aid things will still kind of work themselves out we just won't have the right. encumbrance right. of money in the way and, and stuff like that and it could work out that way it, it's definitely possible um, we are such a, a, a global world now though that that means supply lines coming from around the world and, and with the just-in-time system that you know any any major hiccup in that that totally shuts down. It is a little bit more difficult to to imagine everything continuing on exactly as it, it has been, especially oh, if it's just it an isolated not. pocket. But uh, I'm very much a proponent of regionalism, where mm-hmm. um, you have a regional self sufficiency. Maybe five percent comes from outside. Sure, and that's definitely a, the things. You, you uh, know. Yeah, that's definitely a worthy goal. But you know, just just like permaculture, that that takes a lot of groundwork to to get those things yeah. built up beforehand. but And you can't make things out of rare earth minerals, things that only come from three places in the world, you know, no pink Himalayan salt. Yeah. Um, Although, I mean, but, with, uh, yeah. with the amount of e-waste that we have in any given landfill at this point, maybe it'll become uh, a worthwhile endeavor to just go digging through and, you know, popping old lithium batteries out of, of iPads and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> if, if you really get to the point where you need that that sort of, of mineral. The new toxic mills of the future. Yeah, the, exactly. But the other thing that comes to mind when reading this, uh, like talking about the sharing of different types of labor, doing the hard work, it definitely reminds me hardcore of the Paracom model hmm. in what he calls, uh, this is um, Robin Handel and Michael Albert. He called, they, they call it the balanced job complex. That hmm. in any firm, slash enterprise, slash co-op, um, the work is divided up based on its empowerment value. You know, writing the book, that's high empowerment. Publishing, editing, high empowerment. Printing the book, low. Doing the printing press, low empowerment. You know, uh, or in our case, uh, maintaining the printers, uh, changing the ink, ordering the ink, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, filling the ink cartridges. <laughs> the, but you split up those tasks, mm-hmm. uh, if not by the day, but that you know everyone does a little bit of it. Right. Um, and, uh, and that kind of helps because that's one of those inequalities that come about through doing work, um, or any kind of F like doing anything really that, uh, uh, there's a uh, division of labor is both really important to our society and industry of any kind, uh, and, and even organization too. Uh, um, but it's also a hindrance to like because it creates inequalities Mm -hmm. if say those divisions are like between one person managing you know doing the doing the numbers being Mm -hmm. the the treasurer um you know versus the secretary that just runs the meetings Mm -hmm. Uh, although those are important positions i I guess i'm maybe thinking more volunteer pool yeah yeah, whatever. But but you can think of your own example. Uh-huh. For sure. Um, or the division of labor over the whole over whole industries, doctors versus janitors. And if they were all 
part owners of a hospital mm -hmm. um, who would be more qualified to make decisions about the running of the hospital. And this is the kind of thing that right wingers may bring up. Like, oh, you think a janitor has any? They, I mean, this goes for actually conservatism in all voting. Right. Most, you know, a lot of people are not educated enough to vote. They don't know what they want or need. Yeah. They're really they, they vote for Trump if they're you know if they're not uh, uh, with it enough or uh, informed, or they could be all misinformed. Mm -hmm. And this is created by the division of labor of our society mm -hmm. that some people are really well informed about strategy issues geopolitics right. and others no no sh goddamn shit because they're working in, on the farm right. or they're uh walmart right. employees and that has absolutely nothing to do with anything essential about any any class of people it's it's not just oh coincidentally all the, the smartest and best people happen to also come from rich families and go to the best schools and and get the best uh you know uh spots in their fraternity which they then leverage into jobs at, at, at high you know high High uh, finance firms and, and that and that sort of thing. No, that's not at all how it happens. It's just it's in fact the opposite. Just that some people happen to get an advantage at some point back in history, and their family has has leveraged it ever since to maintain that. So yes, in many cases, the janitor will wow. run the hospital better than the people who are already making the decisions, it, it, given the right time and, and ability to to um, get a handle on the necessary. Um, components of, of running a, a hospital for sure oh yeah and then in the next paragraph after we resume he'll mention that printing is still in its embassy it's going to get a lot better <laughs> a lot fucking better yeah well that's man that's that's the understatement of the book really oh we got some more comments coming in uh, again from zach app here uh let's see first he, he says uh, i keep calling you he please correct me if i'm, I'm wrong in that that gendering uh I'm deeply op optimistic yet brutally realistic. I'm assuming about the, the future of the earth. I would have to agree with that. And that's really the only way to exist. I mean, if we were to just get so uh, pessimistic about things that, that we, you know, as they say, take the black pill, and then what, what's, what's the point of talking about anything? You, you might as well move over to the grill pill section of, of the online <laughs> culture. Just uh, get yourself some tasty burgers and that watch the world burn. Yeah. <laughs> well, as Carlin would say, as George Carlin said, the earth will be fine. We're a fuck. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's really, that has to be the, our focus, you know, in, in a very serious way. It's, it's but the, yeah, like the whole, the momentum of industrial society. Like I, I, did, I did mention this in a black pill way. <laughs> the, it's just going to like, it's going to have to run out on its own. Yeah. It, it has its momentum. We can't really act on the system as a whole we can do what we can and do our best to shift things for our own lives and for the lives you know seven generations forward and that that, that that's where the optimism can come that we right. know things can be shifted because previous generations shifted things right you know the the socialists of 200 years ago uh, 100 years ago did not and capitalism, not by a long shot, but they did create the eight-hour work week, mm -hmm. and now we we have the time to watch TV, right? You know, and and, and cook our own dinner and, and emancipate women so that they can. Uh, we don't have those strict divisions as as much, but all those divisions were created by capitalism. So it's almost like it, again, it creates problems. It solves the problems that it creates half the, most of the time. Uh, well, the the problem that his had, has solved uh, that it didn't create was that of material scarcity, mm -hmm. and now it has created the problem of time and access scarcity. Right. So that's kind of what our mission is. Yes. It's not really to make our industrial capitalism sustainable. That's something that's kind of like, like on track and it's on, it's train tracks. It's off track and we can't really stop the train, mm -hmm. but we're on a moving train. Yeah. And we can, we can work on that scarcity now, now that the physical scarcity has been solved. Um, yeah. I, automation or whatever. I, I think there is, there's definitely a lot of truth to the idea that, um, the major change will happen when something, some material conditions change. And, and whether that's, there's just not enough, or 
workers don't even have enough money to continue living and and they just finally there's no other option but to to revolt or whether that's climate change uh, forcing us to reevaluate the way we use the earth um, or whether that's just the the uh, the material that keeps the engine of capitalism running you know another thing it could be is they just they run out of uh impoverished nations to exploit you know at, at some point they because they, they always have to have a new yeah. person it, yeah capitalism is is yeah on the global scale is very much kind of like a ponzi scheme you always have to have new money coming in the door to keep yeah. the engine going you so, think about how more uh workers in china over the last 15 years have gone on strike Right. Um, and they are demanding actual better living conditions uh, and, and working conditions. You know, they don't need the suicide net so much anymore because they won concessions. Uh, and, the, and the Communist Party Congress has, uh, you know, shifted about what is being you know, prioritized. And, and also, like, there's a whole, like, macro level of, like, industrial technology being disseminated so that Asia and Africa are being like actually catching up mm -hmm. and that they've been 50 to 100 years behind yeah since the middle ages and but that like technology gap kind of has shifted you know it's it, it reversed for you know 500 years and it's going to probably reverse back mm -hmm. now all the societal and technological leaps will be made in asia instead mm -hmm. of europe yeah, in America. Yeah, I mean that's. But that's a hundred. That's a hundred years away. We'll all be mostly dead. Yeah, maybe. I mean, China was definitely the first to come out with the five G network. So, you know. Sure. That, or I mean, but it's not about waiting for the good stuff to happen. Right. You know? It's like weird because that's what peak oil was kind of about. It was kind of yeah, like saying, kind of. Well, I mean, it wasn't. It was saying we need to change things now because things will get bad later, or we'll be forced to give up car culture. Right. And. There can be a fatalism. We can, like, don't rely on it, you know? Yeah, don't rely well, definitely. On some fake Marxist, like a pseudo-Marxist thing of, like, oh, it's just, just waiting for revolution will happen yeah, naturally yeah. from the no. contradictions. Right. Now that, that... Yeah. Even, even, even Leninists back then or whatever didn't really, you know, they didn't believe that. They believed in, well, they make t making opportunities, I guess, from those things. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's opportunities for us, and we yeah. need to take them. No, definitely. Um, we we, but, we need to be... But also argue about which ones are the good ones and which right. ones aren't. We, I we... think being a DSA member is not a good opportunity because that was an opportunity from the 80s or even before that. Well, yeah, the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the opportunity that lefties were making then. Mm -hmm. We have to make our own. Yeah, that, that, that's a fair point, for sure. Yeah, um, I was going to say something else, but I, I can't think of it right now. Uh, Zach Epps says over 1 billion people at the moment are either squatting or living in slums. How many will it take? And, and sorry for the dimmer topic. That's, that's no problem at all. That's, that's part of the picture. We have to look at, at the potential good and the potential bad and the, and the material realities that we're facing right now. I, I don't know what that tipping point is going to be. Um, and I, I would, I would wager to say that no one really does. I think it probably is not going to be seen uh coming by by the vast majority if and when it, it finally does come but i i think as as dan you so so uh rightly bring up we have to do what we can with what we have right now i mean that we have to be realistic about our material conditions and our and our abilities to use our material conditions to you know move in the direction that we want to right now we can't just wait for you know the other shoe to drop or or anything like that we have to be you know, realistic, uh, you know, not not imagine that we're just going to tomorrow smash capitalism and, and that's going to be it. But at the same time, uh, build whatever networks we can to prepare in, if in case bad things happen, but also live a good life, even if they don't, you know, have have more community, more connection, more solidarity, more uh, more power against the usual speech. The power. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Uh, let, let's keep on moving along. Moreover, the art of printing that has so little progress in Schoenberg is still in its infancy. It takes two hours to compose and type what is written in 10 minutes, but more expeditious methods of multiplying thought are being sought after and will be discovered. What a pity every author does not have to take his share in the printing of his works. 
what progress printing would have already made. We should no longer be using the movable letters as in the 17th century. Part three. Is it a dream to conceive a society in which, all having become producers, all having received an education that enables them to cultivate science or art, and all having leisure to do so, men would combine to publish the works of their choice by contributing each his share of manual work? We have already hundreds of learned, literary, and other societies, and these societies are nothing but voluntary groups of men interested in certain branches of learning and associated for the purpose of publishing their works. The authors who write for the periodicals of these societies are not paid, and the periodicals are not for sale. They are sent gratis to all quarters of the globe, to other societies cultivating the same branches of learning. This member of the society may insert in its review a one-page note summarizing his observations. Another may publish therein an extensive work, the results of long years of study. While others will confine themselves to consulting the review as a starting point for further research, it does not matter. All these authors and readers are associated for the production of works in which all of them take an interest. It is true that a learned society, like the individual author, goes to a printing office where workmen are engaged to do the printing. Nowadays, those who belong to the learned societies despise manual labor, which indeed is carried on under very bad conditions. But a community which would give a generous, philosophic, and scientific education to all its members would know how to organize manual labor in such a way that it would be the pride of humanity. Its learned societies would become associations of explorers, lovers of science, and workers, all knowing a manual trade and all interested in science. If, for example, the society is studying geology, all will contribute to the exploration of the Earth's strata. Each member will take his share in research, and 10,000 observers, where we have now only 100, will do more in a year than we can do in 20 years. And when their works are to be published, 10,000 men and women skilled in different trades will be ready to draw maps, engrave designs, compose, and print the books. With gladness will they give their leisure, in summer to exploration, in winter to indoor work. And when their works appear, they will find not only 100, but 10,000 readers interested in their common work. This is the direction in which progress is already moving. Even today, when England felt the need of a complete dictionary of the English language, the birth of a littre, who would devote his life to this work, was not waited for. Volunteers were appealed to, and a thousand men offered their services, spontaneously and gratuitously, to ransack the libraries, to take notes, and to accomplish in a few years a work which one man could not complete in his lifetime. In all branches of human intelligence, the same spirit is breaking forth, and we should have a very limited knowledge of humanity could we not guess that the future is announcing itself in such tentative cooperation, which is gradually taking the place of individual work. For this dictionary to uh, be a really collective work, it would... Go ahead. Just a quick note. Um, the example of the dictionary of the English language, uh, this is depicted rather well, at least from my mind, uh, by a movie produced in the last few years starring George Clooney uh, called The Professor and the Prisoner. Hmm. I haven't heard of that one. I recall. Um, it was on Netflix. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll look it up then. Um, but anyway. Um, otherwise, uh, so do you think this is a good description of the process of the internet? <laughs> yeah, I, I would, you know, that was kind of coming to my mind as, as he was saying that, yeah, there's just this building and building to the point where any one person can learn all they need to know without ever having to set foot in a classroom about any given subject. I, I think we're definitely at that point. You know, the, the conspiracy theories and, and outright lies that float around aside, uh, that, that the good information definitely is out there and available for people right now. Not just education, but like communities of artists yeah. and, and uh, fanfic writers mm -hmm. and all that. Um, it's only when it kind of, this is just my imposition, that when it interacts with uh, monetization and market economics that it gets toxic and stupid. Um, and the same goes with the... Um, uh, uh, new Age and uh, conspiracy theory stuff. I mean, it's when you make money off of it that it then is incentivized yeah. to be a bullshit artist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A grifter, let's say. Yeah. Um, this is why the whole, like, uh, socialist grifters. If we are acting as socialists and anarchists, then, yeah, we wouldn't be grifters because we are... Our incentive structure, our principles, are not that we're making as much money as possible. It should just make enough plus a surplus that we then spend on our projects. 
or we or we give it to others for projects, which it was really weird that like Bosch was flexing that he does this, but he doesn't gloat about it. Like he thinks it's gloating if you tell people what you do if you're surplus to say like, yeah, I give all these charities, I help all these other people out. I'm not hoarding the money that I get. Mm-hmm. But that's not a gloat. No, that's I don't think so either. Transparency. That's, right. That's accountability as far as I'm concerned. That's proof. That's you know. But it's like, oh, you know, I, it's, it's, I'm giving in if I have to prove I'm not a grifter or if I'm. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, that I do do physical activism. He, he yeah. doesn't want to make the challengers bright in some way by saying, no, I do do, you know, activism uh-huh. in real life, and he thinks that's giving the ch- like people who say that activism should be done yeah. in real life and not just online purely mm-hmm. you give giving them power to do what exactly yeah i don't know i don't know uh anyway. i I don't, I don't think that's glowing at all either if anything especially when it's a, a, a figure like a, a big online leftist it's it i think it serves two purposes and one of one of which is is just being a leader saying hey i don't just say these things i i i do them and yeah, you exactly. should too and and also it's um, yeah it's it's holding yourself accountable saying hey you know I I actually believe in this stuff and here's how um, and also it can highlight whatever organization that, that a, a given uh, personality may be donating to it can it can give it can boost their signal um, the, the people that trust that particular His argument creator. was that he thought it was like favoritism or something he doesn't want like maybe he doesn't he feels maybe rightfully that people will like hit him up more often than oh can you help me about this you know he can be selective I and mean, whatever but that's also that's the inequality of charity yeah you know, and i'd also say i wish i had that sort of a problem <laughs> the charities were calling me up constantly because they knew that i had a lot of surplus but but i digress yeah. anyway uh yeah let's i think we should keep on moving here we are, let's see, we're about halfway through, so I think we should uh, keep going. How, how, how um, long are you good for going tonight, Dan? We can go another hour. Another hour? Okay, okay. Let's let's try and get this knocked out in an hour. We're almost at the two-hour mark yeah. already, but let's... Let's, let's, let's jibber-jabber. Let, yeah, all right. Although I do enjoy it. I, I don't mind the digressions at all. I think it's, it's, it's really nice to have just kind of an open, freewheeling discussion. Especially about stuff that that is hard to relate to um, the present for a lot of people. You know, he's definitely talking about a different time, and it's obvious. So, here we go. Anyway, it, at the same time, he's talking about our time. You know? yeah, well, you, there's definitely many parallels and, and many of the same problems yeah. that we face today, which is which is why I think it's still relevant. That's, yeah. that's, that's, no, that's, no, 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 no. But I mean, like the page of mm-hmm. like this is how an anarchist art scene would work, um, and he basically is describing you know form boards. Right. Yeah, very good. All right, let's continue then. Volunteer authors, printers, and printers' readers should have worked in common. But something in this direction is done already in the socialist press, which offers us examples of manual and intellectual work combined. It happens in our newspapers that a socialist author composes in lead his own article. True, such attempts are rare, but they indicate in which direction evolution is going. They show the road of liberty. In future, when a man will have something useful to say, a word that goes beyond the thoughts of his century, he will not have to look for an editor who might advance the necessary capital. He will look for collaborators among those who know the printing trade and who approve the idea of his new work. Together, they will publish the new book or journal. Literature and journalism will cease to be a means of money making and living at the cost of others. But is there anyone who knows literature and journalism from within and who does not ardently desire that literature should at last be able to free itself from those who formerly protected it? and who now exploit it, and from the multitude which, with rare exceptions, pays it in proportion to its mediocrity, or to the ease with which it adapts itself to the bad taste of the greater number, letters and science will only take their proper place in the work of human development when, freed from all mercenary bondage, they will be exclusively cultivated by those that love them, and for those that love them. Part four. Go for it. Just, just a quick word on, he actually, okay, he, he answered my question on, like, how does he expect us to still be organized? And he basically says, oh, yeah, you just have to make friends with a publisher, uh, with the printer. Yeah. Like, you just make friends with the yeah. printer. You're not actually 
working in the same workplace, mm -hmm. but or whatever, but you have to make friends. And that kind of speaks to like what this one Swiss meta modernist philosopher talks about how like from physical financial capital we move we move towards the importance of social capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That like you can't like social on social media, like what we do or what Twitch do, does is that you monetize based on the social capital, how many right. how popular you are as a person. Right. Versus how much money you have or how much viol violence you could exert. <laughs> sure. I don't know if that's necessarily better because it favors those who are more likable and okay, what's yeah. usually valued as being likable is being extroverted or being taller or something like that. And having spicy so, takes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> spicy, you have to be an edge. Um, and that's kind of something that uh, incel dumb kind of points out is that like, there's a lot of different, um, there's, and there, and there are seeing, obviously there's maturity missing. But even when you can be really mature and still not be likable. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. In some, some scenes, you're not likable because you're more mature. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then you don't get hired, you know, or, or you don't get the good job. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't really have a whole lot more to add to that. I think you covered it pretty we well. We don't get the opportunity since we're talking about like a post-capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, I, think, I think that's, I mean, he, he does kind of leave things kind of, just the sketches where like he just has a lot of faith in things just kind of self-organizing yeah, yeah. and we do live in a pretty complex society uh yeah. especially compared to to kerpotkin's time so you know I, I don't think there's anything wrong with kind of leaving things vague like that i, I think it it probably is true that, that people will self-organize to a to a pretty high degree um just hopefully not in ways that that yeah. you know one group or another is, is lording over. That's just what, the just something we know now is that social capital is a thing and it matters. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that wasn't really, it was never on anyone's mind until really recently. Well, yeah, I mean, it, there was far fewer platforms for there to be, um, you know, more yeah. than a handful of, of luminaries for any given field. So yeah, I'd, I'd say it's definitely more okay. important to, for sure. Let's continue on. Science and art must be cultivated by free men. Only on this condition will they succeed in emancipating themselves from the yoke of the state of capital and of the bourgeois mediocrity which stifles them. What means has the scientist of today to make researches that interest him? Should he ask help of the state, which can only be given to one candidate in a hundred, and which none may obtain who does not ostensibly promise to keep to the beaten track? Let us remember how the Institute of France censured Darwin, how the Academy of St. Petersburg treated Mendeleev with contempt, and how the Royal Society of London refused to publish Jules' paper, in which he determined the mechanical equivalent of heat, finding it unscientific. It is why all great researches, all discoveries revolutionizing science, have been made outside academies and universities, either by men rich enough to remain independent like Darwin and Lyell, or by men who undermine their health by working in poverty and often in great straits, losing no end of time for want of a laboratory, and unable to procure the instruments or books necessary to continue their researches, but persevering against hope and often dying before they had reached the end in view, their name is Legion. Altogether, the system of help granted by the state is so bad that science has always endeavored to emancipate itself from it. For this very reason, there are thousands of learned societies organized and maintained by volunteers in Europe and America, some having developed to such a degree that all the resources of subvention societies and the wealth of millionaires would not buy their treasures. No governmental institution is as rich as the Zoological Society of London, which is supported by voluntary contributions. It does not buy the animals which in thousands people its gardens. They are sent by other societies and by collectors of the entire world. The Zoological Society of Bombay will send an elephant as a gift. Another time, a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros is offered by Egyptian naturalists. And these magnificent presents are pouring in every day, arriving from all quarters of the globe, birds, reptiles, collections of insects, etc. These consignments often comprise animals that could not be bought for all the gold in the world. Thus, a traveler who has captured an animal at life's peril and now loves it as he would love a child will give it to the society because he is sure it will be cared for. The entrance fee paid by visitors, and they are numberless, suffices for the maintenance of that immense institution. What is defective in the Zoological Society of London, and in other kindred societies, is that the member's fee cannot be paid in work. 
that the keepers and numerous employees of this large institution are not recognized as members of the society. While many have no other incentive to joining the society than to put the Kabbalistic letters FZS, Fellow of the Zoological Society, on their cards. In a word, what is needed is a more perfect cooperation. We may say the same about inventors that we have said of scientists. Who does not know what sufferings nearly all great inventions that have come to light have cost? Sleepless nights, families deprived of bread, want of tools and materials for experiments, is the history of nearly all those who have enriched industry with inventions which are the truly legitimate pride of our civilization. Oh, Edison didn't need sleep. But what are we to do to alter conditions (laughs) that everybody is convinced are bad? Patents have been tried, and we know with what results. The inventor sells his patent for a few shillings, and the man who has only lent the capital pockets the often enormous profits resulting from the invention. Besides, patents isolate the inventor. They compel him to keep secret his researches, which therefore end in failure, whereas the simplest suggestion, coming from a brain less absorbed in the fundamental idea, sometimes suffices to fertilize the invention and make it practical. Like all state control, patents hamper the progress of industry. Thought being incapable of being patented, patents are a crying injustice in theory, and in practice they result in one of the great obstacles to the rapid development of invention. What is needed to promote the spirit of invention is, first of all, the awakening of thought, the boldness of conception which our entire education causes to languish. It is the spreading of a scientific education which would increase the number of inquirers a hundredfold. It is faith that humanity is going to take a step forward. Because it is enthusiasm, the hope of doing good, that has inspired all the great inventors. The social revolution alone can give this impulse to thought, this boldness, this knowledge, this conviction of working for all. Then we shall have vast institutes supplied with motor power and tools of all sorts, immense industrial laboratories open to all inquirers, where men will be able to work out their dreams, after having acquitted themselves of their duty towards society, where they will spend their five or six hours of leisure, where they will make their experiments, where they will find other comrades, experts in other branches of industry, likewise coming to study some difficult problem, and therefore able to help and enlighten each other. The encounter of their ideas and experience causing the longed-for solution to be found. And yet again, this is no dream. Solonoi Gorodok in Petersburg has already partially realized it as regards technical matters. It is a factory well furnished with tools and free to all. Tools and motor power are supplied gratis. Only metals and wood are charged for at cost price. Unfortunately, workmen only go there at night when worn out by 10 hours labor in the workshop. Moreover, they carefully hide their inventions from each other, as they are hampered by patents and capitalism, that bane of present society, that stumbling block in the path of intellectual and moral progress. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I could probably go on for... Makerspace! Makerspace! Yeah, oh yeah, makerspace. I love, I love that as a concept. But, but man, I could go on for hours about just how ridiculous the entire patent system is. Uh, the I, I mean, and I, I'm not gonna because we really should be moving along. But, yeah. but just, just one point. It's not, a, it's not a French idea, you know. Yeah, yeah, but just, just the idea that like there are only now songs from the 1920s that are starting to come into public domain. It, mm-hmm. what, in what world is, is that just? In what world is depriving society of, of creative uses of, of all of that material for a hundred years? In, just like it's just it's just in the eyes of the capitalistic. Yeah, because they can squeeze every penny out America. of it, and they can they can. I think it's interesting. He, he calls patent law like a tool of the state. Hmm. I mean, I think the state. I'll pick up on that. You know, has pad law because of capitalists. For right? sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for it's, sure. It's Disney that fought to extend these patents a hundred years. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a idea of some Republican senator. Um, it's usually been artists or companies acting in in markets, the capitalist market, uh, that pushed for patent law and yeah. extending patents. Oh, and just keeping on so, extending and extending. Past the artist's yeah. death, like at, at, at the very least. Kinds of things like genetic material and, oh, and yeah. processes. Yeah. And hell, even, even, um, and it, it extends down into like not something too legal. Like there's this candidate for mayor in, in Albany. And, uh, and during an interview talking about how she 
was doing her petitions, she called it like a trade secret. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I kind of know what it is because I've been around the block with some of these people. Sure. I mean, basically go to one apartment building and basically get like 30, 50 petitions. Okay. But, um, or they know the block with all the old people on it. And right. The, the people, the people are there during the day. <laughs> yeah. 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 And they never say no. Right. Um, these are the trade secrets. But the for fact sure. that you talked about like that, like, yeah, oh yeah, that's a special for me because this is a competition after all. Once we're in office, we're all a team working together. It's collaborative. We all love collaborative democracy, you know, behind the middle, mm. uh, bipartisanship. But the process for doing politics is completely cutthroat, competitive, light sheet steel, whatever it takes. Yeah. And that's that's one of those contradictions where, like, electoral form kind of needs to – it's not about making elections more competitive, like allowing for more candidates – but it really should be about making it so that it's not even a competition anymore. It right. is about expanding the inclusion of who is mm-hmm. a quote unquote elected official. Right. Right. In the, in the, in there. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. definitely. People, hate, people hate making assembly uh, councils or legislative bodies bigger though. They, they don't like that. I know. Yeah. Cause, cause that, this is their own power, po- their own power, their own personal power. Yeah, you gotta gotta always stoke the fear for the masses, because uh, you know then they'll just come for you, because that's what you're that's what you definitely do to them. So <laughs> New Hampshire doesn't seem to have this problem. Um, oh yeah, other, yeah. Well, they have a very large legislative body, oh, and it's that. really easy to get in. That's cool. Makes me surprised there aren't more socialists there, but maybe there are. Yeah. And they just don't get press. I, I was but a lot of other weird, strange political actors do. That's strange. Yeah, I always I always think of New Hampshire as more of like a, a right libertarian sort of a state. So that's that's interesting to hear that though. Well, they get more libertarians there because well, there was the Free State Project, which was literally exactly. like let's get all the libertarians to move us libertarians, Ron Paul, Ron Paul fans to move there, and. It would be interesting if we did something similar, like, but but they never went. It didn't really get that far. It was yeah. more like they they kind of were able to take over one town. You know, the, sure. the, they made they for the majority. Uh, but since they're all ANCAPs, the, the town has gone hell. <laughs> no, you're telling me that in the real world, the ANCAP system breaks down completely. And locals hate you. You know, they did. They should just like you know, who are these fucks? Uh, <laughs> Posing their way of life on me. Yes. Isn't that funny? Uh, coming into town at the onset, violating their own NAP by pissing off the locals. And taking safe power. <laughs> yeah. right uh, oh, we got a new chatter in, in the mix here. Hello to uh, Mike Dixie Rect. Hey, how's it going tonight? How are you feeling? If, you, if you're new to the stream, which I don't think I've seen you before, BLM, absolutely, yep. Black lives always matter, for sure. Trans rights. Trans rights. Yep, definitely. Are Are you on board with with that sort of thing yourself? I'm, I'm just gonna go with Mike for now because Mike Dixie Rect is is kind of a, a mouthful. Um, either way, yep. Uh, if you, so, assuming that you're new to the stream, uh, we we are in the process of going through the audio book of the Conquest of Bread. We're on chapter uh, nine right now. Nine. And this is in one of the definitive books uh, on the anarcho-communist uh, uh, school of thought. Uh, black people, okay. Black people more than trans, but both of them are cool. Okay, you're you're black yourself. Well, welcome. Uh, so it's not my favorite. Okay. I, I don't know which. But tra- oh, trans aren't your favorite. Okay. Well, uh, that's unfortunate. I I, wa- I wasn't being favoritist i was just it's usually no if, no, you, no. if you say blm and as a me as, as a statement of uh yeah support i yeah. just thought it would be yeah to, just, yeah just like black lives matter is, is definitely not a statement that black lives matter more of course that's never the the subtext saying trans we don't have well okay, okay, okay. Let, let, let's not get sidetracked sure. being all overly defensive about it uh-huh uh, as the guy in back who likes more black people, trans people. No, but yeah, no, no problem. Like, uh, I hope you like what we're doing and, and you have some, some input on the, the stuff that we're bringing up. So we're going to start back up with the audiobook pretty soon here. Um, in just one second.
Uh, let me get make sure everything's set up. We'll just we'll just continue along. Uh, talking about luxuries and luxuries take the form of about, like basically the humanities. Yeah, talking about luxuries after a, a, a an imagined revolution where um, things have been redistributed. People are all pretty well set up with the the basics of life, and and now we're looking to push off of that platform. Who's the guy in the back? Oh, in the background. Uh, I don't know. Dan Platt of the Three Left Show. Dan Platt of the Three Left Show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's Dan. So he's he's part of the the Three Left Show, which is a, a really cool podcast you should check out. Uh, he also does Twitch streaming from time to time, so you can check him out there too. Uh, but anyway, we're going to continue on with the uh, the audiobook. So if you have any questions about that, uh, Dan's pronouns are he him. Uh, I'm, I'm correct in remembering that, right, Dan? You can use neo pronouns too. Okay. So he, him, neo pronouns, whatever worked for you. Anyway, uh, continue on. Uh, we're, we're, to, wait, are you guys talking about luxuries? Yeah, we're talking about in, uh, no, no, neo Nazi. I don't know where you're getting that from. Anyway, what we are talking about, just to give you an idea, is Kropotkin is imagining after a revolution, a socialist revolution, or, or an, you know, anarcho-communist in, in his case, revolution, where um, everyone has been made sure to be taken care of. Everyone has housing. Everyone has uh, food and, and clothing and all, the, all the, the basics of life. We're talking about now being able to provide for people to then take that platform and push off of it into uh, whatever interests them, whether that's arts, whether that's just, uh, we, we talked about leisure time, um, and, and, and that and sort science. of thing and science, whatever, you know, whatever that's not technically their, their profession or their vocation, what, uh, you know, what they can do with that time. So that, that's what we mean when we say luxuries, we're not talking about, you know, making a fur coat for every family on the block or anything like that. So it seems to imply that there will not be professional versions of any of these, um, tasks. That there will not be a professional writer. There will just be someone who's good at writing and right. also does his shift at the factory. Right. Because uh, the shifts are so short. It's assuming a 20-hour work week. Also, I'll clarify, I use the term neo-pronouns. This is not a neo-Nazi thing. Uh, neo-pronouns refer to uh, <laughs> that, Z, 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 and all those sure. other funky uh, words and any gender um, neutral or, or, or just using a general they there you go so yeah nothing to do with neo-nazis fuck those guys we hate them here so anyway we're going to continue on with the chapter and you'll, you'll see more of, of what we're talking about part five and what about art from all sides we hear lamentations about the decadence of art we are indeed far behind the great masters of the renaissance the technicalities of art have recently made great progress Thousands of people gifted with a certain amount of talent cultivate every branch, but art seems to fly from civilization. Technicalities make headway, but inspiration frequents artist studios less than ever. Where indeed should it come from? Only a grand idea can inspire art. Art is in our ideal, synonymous with creation. It must look ahead, but save a few rare, very rare exceptions, the professional artist remains too philistine to perceive new horizons. Moreover, this inspiration cannot come from... I, I'm sorry to pause it here. Uh, Mike Dixie yeah. Rect, uh, we're, we're not going to rank people by, by skin tone, and, and you're starting to give me some ideas that maybe you're not acting in good faith. So uh, that just that's kind of a cringe comment to make, and I don't, I don't really appreciate that sort of thing. Um, especially since you're new here, I don't really know you. I don't know where you're coming from with all this stuff. So if you could please refrain from that sort of thing, that's not cool. Yeah, it's not skin tone. Color. I, that doesn't matter. We're not. We don't rank people here. That's that's not cool, at all. And I don't really like the way we're going with that. So, anyway, let's continue on. Let's let's. How did he bring up BLM? Was it BLM question mark or something? Yeah, BLM question mark. Uh, he claims to be a, okay. a black Asian person himself. So I'm I'm assuming uh, the right answer would have been everyone is number one. Okay. Well. Still, like, I don't know you yet, man. I, I, I don't know where you're coming from. Because we all have to be right all the time. This uh -huh. is truly how we invade society. Yeah. Okay. Perpetual correctness. Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Fuck that. Not you, me, me, but that, that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, let, let, let's refrain from that sort of talk and let's listen to what the, the chapter is actually talking about so we can get back on track. Thank you. Be drawn from life. 
and present society cannot arouse it. Raphael and Murillo painted at a time when the search of a new ideal could adapt itself to old religious traditions. They painted to decorate great churches, which represented the pious work of several generations. The basilic, with its mysterious aspect, its grandeur, was connected with the life itself of the city and could inspire a painter. He worked for a popular monument. He spoke to his fellow citizens, and in return he received inspiration. He appealed to the multitude in the same way as did the nave, the pillars, the stained windows, the statues, and the carved doors. Nowadays, the greatest honor a painter can aspire to is to see his canvas, framed in gilded wood, hung in a museum, a sort of old curiosity shop, where you see, as in the Prado, Murillo's ascension next to a beggar of Velasquez and the dogs of Philip II. Poor Velasquez and poor Murillo, poor Greek statues which lived in the Acropolis of their cities and are now stifled beneath the red cloth hangings of the Louvre. When a Greek sculptor chiseled his marble, he endeavored to express the spirit and heart of the city. All its passions, all its traditions of glory, were to live again in the work. But today, the united city has ceased to exist. There is no more communion of ideas. The town is a chance agglomeration of people who do not know one another, who have no common interest, save the enriching of themselves at the expense of one another. The fatherland does not exist. What fatherland can the international banker and the rag picker have in common? Only when cities, territories, nations, or groups of nations will have renewed their harmonious life will art be able to draw its inspiration from ideals held in common. Then will the architect conceive the city's monument which will no longer be a temple, a prison, or a fortress. Then will the painter, the sculptor, the carver, the ornament. The worker will know where to put their canvases, their statues, and their decorations, deriving their power of execution from the same vital source, and gloriously marching all together towards the future. But till then, art can only vegetate. The best canvases I'm of very modern- sorry to do this. Uh, Mike, you're, you're derailing the conversation here. This, this is not the time to be, you know, proving that, that so-and-so is or is not a racist. We told you we don't like Nazis here. We told you what we believe in. And you seem to be just trying to pick a fight here. I, I don't really appreciate that. So uh, this is going to be your last warning. If you can't do that, I'm going to have to, I'm going to at the very least going to have to mute you for a, a day or two. Because uh, that's not cool, man. Like, we're, we're talking about something else here. And you're just derailing it with the things that you're talking about. And you're not really acting in good faith either. So I don't appreciate that. So let's continue. Please try to be better. Represent nature, villages, valleys, the sea with its dangers, the mountains. You cannot come on stream. I don't do that stuff. But how can the this painter express the show. poetry this of work in the fields if he has only contemplated it, imagined it? I don't know. If he either. has never delighted in it himself. If he only knows it as a bird of passage knows the country he soars over on his migrations. If, in the vigor of early youth, he has not followed the plow at dawn and enjoyed mowing grass with a large swathe of the scythe next to hardy haymakers vying in energy with lively young girls who fill the air with their songs, the love of the soil and of what grows on it is not acquired by sketching... Go for it. No, no, I'm just joking. Like, oh, sexist women? Women singing? (laughs) Why does that be women? Anyway. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, let's let's not do it. He seems to be using he's using a lot of words to just talk about that like art will return to the street. Uh, you'll have street art, urban art, um, art for its own sake, I guess. But uh, uh, you know, th- th- this is a this is a particular like way of talking about art and aesthetics, saying that it comes from big ideas. Like, well, art kind of comes from living. I mean, I there's, there's better aesthetic theories, uh, especially modern ones. So, yeah, so talking about R in this way, like, it's kind of not important. Although I, I guess he just keeps kind of, what he's harping on is that, as in his time, R is the domain of the rich. It's something you invest in. It's something usually produced to uh, express your wealth. Um, while the struggling, starving artist, or the artist that he was professional or rather an artist that works for the public in a way um or you know for themselves can simply do and they can make art and then they don't even have to worry about selling it or whether it's popular or they can just make it mm-hmm. and, uh, and people can uh, hire them to do stuff not for money but just to give permission yeah you can paint yeah. my the side of this building 
our committee met and we love your work do the mural yeah, i think city, murals in cities are particularly a good representation of like urban art democratically managed yeah i, I like that you know and i you know i do some art myself i, I do um nature photography and i i've very rarely been paid for it but that's never really guided when and where i do it i just i just do it because i love it and i i would have to imagine that that's going to be the case for most artists you find out there that they, they have no problem yeah all the work's done now i can go do art for people who are really grateful that that sounds pretty great i don't see any problem with, with a, a system like that that sounds pretty cool so yeah that's all i got to say about that um let's continue on it is only in its service and without loving it how to paint it this is why all that the best painters have produced in this direction is still so imperfect not true to life nearly always merely sentimental. There is no strength in it. You must have seen a sunset when returning from work. You must have been a peasant among peasants to keep the splendor of it in your eye. You must have been at sea with fishermen at all hours of the day and night, have fished yourself, struggled with the waves, faced the storm, and after rough work, experienced the joy of hauling a heavy net, or the disappointment of seeing it empty, to understand the poetry of fishing. You must have spent time in a factory, known the fatigues and the joys of creative work, forged metals by the vivid light of a blast furnace, have felt the life in a machine, to understand the power of man, and to express it in a work of art. You must, in fact, be permeated with popular feelings to describe them. Besides, the works of future artists who will have lived the life of the people, like the great artists of the past, will not be destined for sale. They will be an integrate part of a living whole that would not be complete without them, any more than they would be complete without it. Men will go to the artist's own city to gaze at his work, and the spirited and serene beauty of such creations will produce its beneficial effect on heart and mind. Art, in order to develop, must be bound up with industry by a thousand intermediate degrees blended, so to say, as Ruskin and the great socialist poet Morris have proved so often and so well. Everything that surrounds man, in the street, in the interior and exterior of public monuments, must be of a pure artistic form. Uh, cut. But this will only. Sure. Just want to point out um, jargon note. Ruskin is like an architectural theorist from the 19th century. And uh, he was mostly kind of a cataloger of all the ornaments in urban design and commenting on them. So hmm. just, just, just a note of who, who the hell is this Ruskin? And then why does he talk of it's the pure artistic art form? It's all very much jargon, unless you've been, you've gone to architecture school or art school, um, and even then you could very much specialize in certain areas. Yeah. All right. That's definitely stuff I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting a little distracted here again by chat. I, I apologize for that. Um, Kaiser Is Matt, ben, it, it was Mike doing the thing where because we say Black Lives Matter, we're racist. I don't think so because he he claimed to be black as well, uh, but he just wanted. I don't care. Yeah, so I I don't know. Anyone I, can I, claim they're black. Yeah, I I timed him out for ten minutes and and we we very well maybe wrapped up by that point anyway. So, but now we have another person, uh, Kaiser Bunny One. What are you proposing to take from me today? Uh, we're going to take away your ignorance about leftist theory. That's one thing. Um, we can we're going to take away your propaganda and, and programming. That perhaps you've grown up with you know, living in what I'm assuming is a capitalist society, if you're coming at me from that. Uh, but what we're not going to do is debate, so I hope you haven't come in bad faith as well. Enlighten you. Well, you know, you're coming in kind of late into the programming here. Uh, you can take a look at my, my VODs if, if you want to uh, take a look at the, the sort of ideas we've been talking about. I also have a, a YouTube channel where I archive all this stuff. It's also a bread theory, so you can go see that as well. Um, but yeah, this, this isn't a one-on-one -on -one tutor session. Right. I, I think we should we should you know kind of finish here and let the audience be the audience. Yeah. Except for the the points where you check in on chat and cover, and what they're asking. Yep. You, you're right about that. I, I I do apologize again. I'm gonna I went ahead and banned that person too. So, <sighs> boy, what a night for uh, bad faith actors. So anyway. We're, we're coming up to the, the end of the chapter here, so we'll get it wrapped up pretty soon. So, 
Anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah we're right in a society in which all can enjoy comfort and leisure. Then we shall see art associations, in which each can find room for his capacity. For art cannot dispense with an infinity of purely manual and technical supplementary works. These artistic associations will undertake to embellish the houses of their members, as those kind volunteers, the young painters of Edinburgh, did in decorating the walls and ceilings of the great hospital for the poor in the city. A painter or sculptor who has produced a work of personal feeling will offer it to the woman he loves, or to a friend. Executed for love's sake, will his work, inspired by love, be inferior to the art that today satisfies the vanity of the Philistine because it has cost much money? The same will be done as regards all pleasure not comprised in the necessaries of life. He who wishes for a grand piano will enter the association of musical instrument makers, and by giving the association part of his half-day's leisure, he will soon possess the piano of his dreams. If he is passionately fond of astronomical studies, he will join the association of astronomers, with its philosophers, its observers, its calculators, with its artists in astronomical instruments, its scientists and amateurs. And he will have the telescope he desires by taking his share of the associated work. For it is especially the rough work that is needed in an astronomical observatory, bricklayers, carpenters, founders, mechanics work the last touch being given to the instrument of precision by the artist. In short, the five or seven hours a day which each will have at his disposal, after having consecrated several hours to the production of necessities, will amply suffice to satisfy all longings for luxury, however varied. Thousands of associations would undertake to supply them. What is now the privilege of an insignificant minority would be accessible to all. Luxury, ceasing to be a foolish and ostentatious display of the bourgeois class, would become an artistic pleasure. Everyone would be the happier for it. I know there's just like one more. No, no problem. Actually, just let it finish. Okay. So, okay. So, we can clarify what he's actually proposing here when it comes to producing luxury goods. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's strange he only mentions it at the very end, although maybe that's a fault of the writing. I prefer, maybe it's just opinion, my opinion, mm-hmm. that he should have put this further ahead like in part two or something. That people are making essentials for like the first 20 hours a week that they do. Right. And then any luxuries they want, they need to join an association and help make them. Oh. Okay. Because he just gave the example of the piano. You yeah. join people who make instruments and you put in maybe another two hours a week or how many out maybe four and or like a small shift and then you earn your way to a piano sure like or whatever luxury good like whether it's art supplies or whatever you have to help make it but where it gets really sticky with that vision is so many of these there's so many parts you know right. in creating a piano or it's like there's this there's the wires so right. i guess the association first needs to acquire the wire from the metallurgy right and any mentions building a observatory requires bricklayers and sure. and all these other forms of work which either he's suggesting that someone who wants to do astronomy needs to do a, all a little bit of that mm-hmm. Which I guess is part of deprofessionalization that we all become a master of skills, kind of like in the the Heinlein, John Heinlein definition of like a of a, a self the man is a guy man you know someone who's self sufficient who can make art and farm and, da, 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 and do a little bit of everything, <laughs> and this is what makes people free. You know, the freest person is the one who's the least dependent on 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 um, working in a market economy, having to buy other people's services. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a... Yeah, I don't, I don't think I really have much to add to that either, but, but that, yeah, that seems like an, an okay way of doing things, where you put in your labor. And that's how I live, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. There so 30 go. hours a week to pay my rent and bills and, and the stuff that I can't get myself or mm-hmm. learn skills to require. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely does get more complicated, especially bringing it to the modern age where you have things like, you know, a computer or, or a television where you have materials from many, many parts of the world that, that change hands many different times in order to 
make it to you. So you're not you're not necessarily going to have a local computer manufacturing factory. So it does get more complicated with with the modern day, but I don't think it's not doable. Like definitely, you're still going to have computer factories, and if they're just you know sending their goods wherever they're needed, and and you know not necessarily in exchange, but just by the uh, the network of mutual aid, they get the the means to continue on their work and, and sustain their own lives and stuff. Yeah, I could, I could see something like that working on a, on a larger scale. That's not completely I theorize, unrealistic. I theorize as we move towards a regionalism or a more sustainable mm -hmm. global network of trade that it will be necessary to create, uh, manufacture computers or chips or what have you that don't require parts from or minerals from around the world. Okay. Um, yeah. But that's 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 a lift of, of speculative fiction. Sure. In my end, but well, you know, it's 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 another one of those things that eventually we'll have to face as um, certain resources get more and more scarce. You know, even things like lithium yeah. for batteries and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it 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 might be heavy lifting, but at, at the same time, it's going to be have to be done at some point. So. Yeah. Yeah, if we want to keep good. having computers, which I assume mm -hmm. we will. I, I yeah, I assume. I assume uh, yeah, that's going to be something we hold on to, um, for if for nothing yeah. else, just the the knowledge and the communication that it that it offers. But yeah, let's let's wrap up the chapter and then we'll come up with some final thoughts and we'll we'll do our promos and stuff and get on. Performed with a light heart to attain a desired end, a book, a work of art, or an object of luxury, each will find an incentive and the necessary relaxation that makes life pleasant. In working to put an end to the division between master and slave, we work for the happiness of both, for the happiness of humanity. Now, this has that, been a production fact, of Audible Anarchist. Wow. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube. And we'll all be happily, for everyone who had a talent for it, we'll live happily ever after. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's probably the number one criticism I hear about Kropotkin and, and especially this book is that it's it's just so pie in the sky and I just can't imagine a society functioning this way and it depends way too much on goodwill and... and uh, Except the internet functions this way. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the propaganda against that sure. is, is pretty strongly ingrained into people's lives or into people's minds that that in fact people are selfish or at best enlightened self-interested actors and just like the entire rand school of thought that is, is just so you know you, you push back on it at all and it completely crumbles and yet somehow it's it's pervaded into the 21st century it's just it's kind of beyond me i think it's more people want to believe that everyone is uh selfish and and you know uh, only acting in their own best interests, rather much more I so mean, than their. Well, it certainly it is. certainly seems to exist in the cohort of actors who seem to think it's like it's valuable time used to just pick fights online or troll. Like, like yeah. feeling entitled enough to demand that like we bring someone yeah. onto our stream. Yeah, I know. Because because some other streamer does it or something. Right, but. Because they get mucho views from, you know, taking on trolls or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so as a general, like, with this chapter, he's just going through all of the ways that, like, luxury goods would work. Well, like, okay, so mm -hmm. most of the rhetoric here is about explaining that things like art, science, and other associations exist outside of capitalist markets. That's mm -hmm. really all For he sure. has to explain. And then yeah. the rest becomes the nuts and bolts of how will the luxury goods for doing these things mm -hmm. be made in a economy that is unplanned and just mutual aid networks. And I think the whole doing extra work on top of the necessary work makes sense. It's what a lot of us already do when one can afford to. Mm hmm um, by keeping, you know, so, and we do that in our spare time. Yeah. We make art, yeah. we, re we read shit. We do science. If you're science minded, right. 
um, and so on and so on. It's it all exists like Web 1.0 was pretty much anarchistic as far as how it was like organized and how people acted with each other. It was only Web 2.0 that started bringing in monetization and corporations right. creating their own sites and getting a piece of the action. Yep. Like, oh, there's money here. Um, it's like the whole, like, uh, there, there was this analogy to the internet in the Wild West, that, you know, it was all untamed, uncivilized, and basically people could do whatever they wanted. And then uh, it was up to corporations or institutions to kind of build forts and enforce Right. Um, in, or control areas in the internet and then expand, slowly expand that area of control until it's everything, mm -hmm. which is kind of how it feels like now. Yeah. Where you try to create something anarchistic, something like, you know, either pirating or without the influence of patent law, and you're basically regulated to, you're, you're, you're made illegal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yep. Yeah. And that's and that's and that's kind of a pattern throughout all of human history. For sure, for sure, yeah. People will move into the hills, and then the hills get conquered too eventually. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and it's just the pattern of hoarding resources in order to uh, lord it over everyone else for as long as you can, and and thinking that that somehow is, you know, as capitalists would put it, uh, the most efficient system we can hope for, the the most equitable system, and the the fairest distribution. Um, kind of doesn't doesn't compute with me it seems to be in contradiction you know in fact they must be on some really good drugs <laughs> yeah well perhaps they were perhaps that's what they were hoarding in the first place <laughs> i've actually heard theories about that i had a a uh, professor in in my undergraduate who was uh, into uh, he was an anthropologist by his phd and a lot of his theories uh, circle around drugs being the the impetus for one thing or another and and his theory for the first early civilizations was that they were uh, they were cultivating ergot, and and that's what caused them to, to stay in one place long enough to to grow the grain and, and hoard it up into storehouses so that they could get high. Basically, <laughs> it was interesting to think about. That, I, I don't know I've, how much. I've heard that theory before. Have you? Especially, okay. Uh, to imagine how like um, one of the first you know yeah the grain crop so you can make yeah. beer. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Sure. Such, yeah. Other such things. There's probably some truth to it, but uh, it was just it was always fun to hear. I mean, it's a little bit of everything, right? Um, well, of course, yeah. There's never going to be one cause. That's what it means to not be perpetually correct, like to not feel like there's one answer to everything. Um, we are all imperfect, or at least nobody's per perfection is a undefinable yeah. quality. For sure, absolutely um, true. Yeah. Oh, at least not be racist. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, circling back to the chapter itself, um, I, I, I kind of like this one. You know, it, it's a question that comes up a lot when, when leftists are trying to, to uh, put out their theories of, of revolution and post-revolution. They say, like, oh, what about all this stuff that I like? You know, I, uh, do I get to keep my PlayStation? You know, I think that, wasn't that, I think that was one of the questions that uh, in the recent Destiny and, and, and Richard Wolf oh. debate, I think Lance actually oh, submitted a, that I, himself. I, I did stay for the question. Q&A. Yeah. I, I did listen to the rest, though. Yeah, I think, um, I think Lance well, did that. Well, it was more like the lecture, it was the Richard Wolf lecture with... With, um, with the pedant destiny with, demanding with, demanding uh, three yeah, hours with, of with, definition. With, with an abrasive student asking uh, questions. Yeah, I think that's a perfect way of framing it, man. I, uh, I think you pretty much have to be, you know, totally sold on, on Some destiny. Some ask the question, is the argument. Uh-huh. To cast doubt on something, to ask questions like, right. "Oh, you have, a, I have a question." And, oh yeah, and it, it kind of act like it can't be answered. Right. You know, to def uh, well rather, it like the 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 argument being made by posing a question is because it can't be answered. Uh -huh. That well, you didn't answer it, thus I win. Yeah, or or also because you didn't answer. What perfect means, or in this in this case, capitalism or socialism. Yeah, or or if you're even though, yeah. sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. What, what was your interpretation? I was I was just going to add on to that and and um, say that also the idea that if you're 
proposed system or your answer can't answer every conceivable scenario that there is uh, perfectly. If, if say, you know, worker cooperatives don't do away with, with 100% of environmental destruction or, or there's no, you know, or, or if there's still um, hierarchy in, in terms of management or in terms of pay, then, well, then it's not even worth entertaining if it can't answer everything. Well, it's like, you know, that's, that's a very unnuanced way of posing things, but it makes you look like it, it just, it just sows doubt. It's, it's really just the whole merchant of doubt system of enforcing the status quo. You know, it's, you know, if you can't answer everything, well, then why am I even talking to you? You know, it, it must be then by extension that what we've got has to be the best of all possible worlds. Cause you know, you don't got all the answers. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting. Well, we can always, we or anyone can always turn things around and say, mm -hmm. well, does your, does the system currently yeah. answer all questions and yeah. provide all needs? Or right. Whatever? right. And the, the, the interesting thing about being a centrist or, or the, what was it? The, uh, Omni liberal, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's that's me. Uh, so whatever he says, he is. This yeah, week. that's what he's going by. Lately, um, is yeah. that he, he gives proposals that he frames as being much more realistic and mm -hmm. acquirable than and socialist ones. Mm -hmm. But I would completely disagree with him. Yeah. Oh. Even oh, reasonable proposals that Destiny or any other centrist puts forward are just as unlikely to happen. Sure. And just as impossible to implement in our system. Right. It is all fanciful until it happens. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. Yeah. Um, unless you're the only people who are being completely like, let's say, reasonable, not reasonable, realistic in what can pass Congress are corporate lobbyists. Mm -hmm. What they propose or what um, certain think tanks um, propose as policy. You know, what, like the ACA. That was the realistic policy proposal because mm -hmm. oh my oh my oh my gosh it did in fact pass yeah it was in fact um so they were they were the ones that were really correct everyone mm -hmm. else is fucking an idiot right uh, for thinking that you could do any other kind of right. healthcare reform yeah in this country yeah we did it y'all Let, you know, let's drop the balloons and go home no point in pushing for anything more healthcare has been made important. <laughs> Uh, I, I, you know, just how to, anyone respects Obama after all of the failures. Oh, I know. Um, but of, of, well, I mean, it, it's more like, um, no, sorry, no, because it's not he's not blamed because throughout his presidency, you have that's the great thing about a two party system, you could just blame the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, everything Obama failed at everything because Republicans were in his way. But yep. I, I was paying attention. Yeah, the Republicans were not in his way. No, not in the first two years, no. not the last six years. No, it was more than was, anything. Oh, was, sorry, I don't mean the system that. as a whole. It's it's not about blaming one person. No, no, I'm not saying one person. It was it was it is the system. Yeah, it's the system. And and, and also and, and obviously we all tuned in to saying no and not participating, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what. And this has drawbacks, but I also. Am not too respectable of say the any DSA or, or the, the socialists or the lefties who are like we're making headway mm -hmm. by being Democratic Party functionaries. Look mm -hmm. at me, I have more power than you. And in a, in a way, they are right. They do have a bit more power than you, but they have power in a okay. shit system that's killing the planet. Yeah. So fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair that point. Fair really point. Bitter, I it is. I'm being I'm being um, a little sarcastic. No, I know, but th there's definitely a truth to that as well. So, yeah, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a version of oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna forget who who said it, but it's it's the the quote, you know, you can win the rat race, but you're still a rat, basically, you know. You can you can well, let, me, let me be counter let me be countered my own uh, ranting that when you are like say a uh, democratic party functionary. There are, and you like when they say, I do have more power. Mm -hmm. These are the good things I'm do doing. I'm mm -hmm. shifting things on the train. Mm -hmm. The train is moving. It is going to go yeah. off a cliff. Black pill whole version of it anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I'm shifting things on the seats and making us more comfortable. That's true. And I'm saying, 
as Bosch would frame it, it's not about building socialism. It is is about uh, saving lives. Yeah. You know, not sacrificing people to to the cause or whatever without yeah. people's consent, I guess. Yeah, to, to the <laughs> whims. Even, yeah. To um, the whims of the uber wealthy who are never satisfied. Mm. Or, or, or the socialist cause of, of doing oh, okay. revolution. revolution. Whatever. Sure. Uh, I see. I see what you're getting. Bosch, Bosch will say, like, of course we have to elect Biden and Democrats. If the Republicans were elected, more people would die. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I see that side. That really isn't extent. a strong answer to that. I don't particularly have one. Mm-hmm. It just, there's just meta situation mm-hmm. that it's all going to get worse for everyone regardless. Right. If things are a little more comfortable, we get a bit more social security. But the argument, this is the DSA's major argument, that by improving conditions for the Democratic Party, even just a bit more health insurance subsidies like the ACA, right. that is improving the working the position of the working class mm-hmm. to act politically, mm-hmm. to actually have the free time to, well, do the luxury things. Mm-hmm. To turn it back. Yeah. Yeah, 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 man. It, it's hard to even know what to but, say about that. Yeah. I, I think but, the, the only really, um, I, I guess in my mind, the only real realistic counter to uh, that sort of electoralism is to say that, yeah, we're not going to have, there's, there's going to be no violent overthrow of the government. That's just unrealistic. Uh, and at the same time, yeah, rearranging the chairs as, as things speed towards disaster may prolong the, the, the journey, but doesn't, doesn't uh, make the major changes we need. So really the only realistic course is to, to build those, those parallel structures to meet the needs that we can't expect electoralism to ever cover, to build the networks, to, uh, hey, there's that word again, become more resilient if and when the time comes that, that the wheels come off. Um, so that, that, that's how I would look at it myself. Um, after, Keep building the mutual aid networks. I mean, I, I guess networks, it's the kind yeah. of thing to learn from all this is just keep expanding the mutual aid network. I would agree with that. Um, it's, it feels like it's just as much of a failed strategy as like any other because mutual aid stuff has also existed for 30 years of going on. Mm-hmm. But a strategy doesn't really come to fruition for like for generations. Yeah, you just got to keep trying at and, it. Yeah, you, know, you got to think of things as still like we're in the we're always in the middle, you know, because like there are people joining the left right now after I've been in it for ten years. So like right. I made goals and deadlines. Like I want the Green Party to actually have elected a congressperson by now. Didn't happen, and yep. it'll happen in the next ten years. Probably not. I could also make the goal that we do that. Um, if you just join the Green Party now, it probably seems like the, there's a bright future ahead. We can do it in 10 years. I joined it seven years ago. I thought maybe there would be some momentum going forward. Mm-hmm. There has not been because yeah. the situation, the social trends have been towards complete deorganization. Mm. Uh, or, 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 or rather, a complete horizontalism. Oh, okay. Which probably should have hit me hard since that's what Occupy was. Mm-hmm. That, like, I should always just be doing horizontalism. Mm-hmm. But to me, Green Party was a little horizontal. Yeah. So, but it wasn't an horizontal strategy. It was just a group that happened to be a bit more horizontal than the Dems were. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in some ways not, because its membership is so limited that you can't even have local groups much, just regional ones. So, yeah. 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 And mutual aid can just be local, um, but certain mutual aid stuff is regional or national because, say, like with BLM or whatever. Yeah, or, or mutual aid, um, disaster relief, just, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah the disaster relief, yeah, uh-huh. mostly that. Yeah. Um, sending stuff to Texas. Sure. Yep, for sure. Well, um, any more closing thoughts before we kind of wrap up for the night? Uh, or do you want to get into uh, plugging your stuff again? Um, 
I'll just finish with, I'll probably think of it as I go. Um, so I'm Dan Plyer, the Three Left Show. Uh, I do radio and podcast, uh, found on all podcasting. I don't really post it to YouTube. What I do post to YouTube is my streams or clips of the streams, um, which is mostly the streams, but anyway. I do the streams. I'm looking to do them once, get, actually set up a once a week schedule, but that's the goal. I usually don't meet it. Um, things happen in life. Yeah. Lots of stuff to Understandable. do. Understandable. Because when it comes to like survival of the next 50 years, Twitch streaming is not really one of those skills that I feel is going to ensure um, a, a good region, regionalism. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but it's a fun hobby to do, nonetheless. Yeah, nothing says um, that if it gets big enough, it couldn't be, though, too. You know? You could, you could have breakouts. Well, certainly as, as, as e-gaming slowly replaces, yeah, or e-sports replace physical sports, mm-hmm. or size sports, or whatever the hell it's going to be called, p-sports. Uh, e-sports, <laughs> um, oh, because, that's, yeah. that's a bad turn Have you phrase. heard? I'll, I'll, maybe I'll talk of this story. Um, I'll have to find it. But, like, in Chicago... There's this big development that has just been proposed and it's going to pass its planning board for an esports center. Really? Yeah. Really? A local congressperson was like, not congress, council person. Sure. Alderman was like ecstatic saying, this is the future. This is going to be a lot of opportunities for our high school students. There's going to be esport. Like, I was skeptical, but then I was shown and I could see how much money and I owned it. And I see how much money this makes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we yep, there's it. big money flowing and, into it all the time. And it's basically essentially a very large internet cafe. <laughs> uh, for sure, yeah. But it's the size of like a medium-sized convention center. Yeah, I just can't. I guess there there must be something about experiencing that in, in a physical space that you can't really even get online. You know, I, I can see that, you know, buying a ticket, showing up and... and seeing things happen to get the feel of the crowd going and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? I, there, why was, not? Um, there was a G4 show called arena and that was teams playing each other on, um, on real tournament or something like that. And mm-hmm. it was entertaining. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm not sold, but certainly zoomers are probably more into it. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then, you know they're going to be driving because I didn't even get into online gaming at all, and I still haven't. So, oh, you haven't? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I dabbled in it for a while. I didn't do it myself, but I, I would watch the the esports things, especially when like StarCraft Two came out, and that was the the big thing. So, but yeah, I can definitely see that being being the the wave of the future. You know, it's something that's that's not nearly as disrupted by things like COVID. So it's definitely got that going for it as well. Yeah. So. Oh, uh, uh, so yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think that'll pretty much do it for tonight. Then I want to, I want to thank you very much again, Dan, for, uh, bearing with all the technical difficulties and no the bad faith actors. I mean, that's always the, uh, the, we're, gonna get those. we're, we're always going to get those. Yeah. Especially when, it's, you, when you just stream. that stick with a principled strategy of ignoring. Yeah. Unless it's part of our strategy to expand our reach. Yeah. But, that's kind of one of those paradoxes of like, you don't get bigger unless you do it. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you know, this is the uh, most this is the most trolls I've had in one night. So I guess that that's got to mean that I'm I'm getting seen somewhere by some people. So I'll I'll take it as a compliment cool. and I'll I'll try to uh, <laughs> get better at staying the course. Yeah. As things go on. So. Um, so uh, also thank you, uh, Zach App, for, for sticking with us and being a good faith commenter. You, you've definitely been a good counterbalance to the, the other people that have been here. <laughs> and they're trolling you. <laughs> Very good. But yeah, I, and, and just by the way, as I saw you were trying to post a link. I For the reason that I'm small and I, I don't have a lot of time to like be monitoring chat, I, I don't allow links in the chat just to keep people safe. I don't want people linking to spam or... Or viruses or anything like that. So I just don't allow that. So um, I hope you understand. Um, and just other than that, uh, yeah, I will have a, 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 got a whole bunch of people interested in, in coming on the show. So I'll have a different guest next week. Um, 
I'll, I'll announce that coming up sometime soon. But but definitely, Dan, I, I, I really always enjoy our chats, and I definitely want to have you on for probably more of the Conquest of Bread. We've still got a few chapters to go. So uh, assuming you're up for it, I, I look forward to our future discussions. Always. All right. Well, thank you so much, sir, and you have a wonderful night. Good night, everybody.